Good evening. This is the March 11th, 2021 meeting of the St. Mary's County Board of Appeals. And we're located right now in the Commissioners of St. Mary's County meeting room of the Chesapeake Building, 41770, 41770 Baldrige Street in Leonardtown, Maryland. I'm the chairman of the board, Dan Nikniaski, and we have four other members that are here with us tonight. So therefore, we have the minimum requirements for a quorum, and we will proceed with the meeting. Due to the Board of Appeals meeting not being open to the public currently, applicants and or representatives are participating through teleconference on WebEx. This meeting can be viewed on channel 95 or the county's YouTube channel. Also, the public may just listen to the meeting on their phones, but not speaking to the board by calling 1-301-579-7236 and then use the access code 963-443, followed by the pound sign. If any members of the public would like to participate in the public session by talking, they may talk to the board during public testimony. Please call the following number, 301-475-4200, extension 1234. When you call this number, Ms. Sherry Young, recording secretary, will take your name, address, phone number, and email. In other words, this will be a virtual sign-in sheet. Ms. Young will place you in line on hold after I announce that we're opening the meeting to public testimony. I will open the meeting to public testimony after presentations and testimony by the applicant and representatives that have been completed. When you are taken off hold, you'll be asked to state your name and address for the record. I will swear you in. You will have three minutes to ask your questions or to make your comments directly to the board. Comments will be recorded and heard by those of us in the Chesapeake Building, WebEx participants, Channel 95, and on YouTube. After the public comment portion of the meeting is over, the case will return to the board for discussion and decision. At this point in time, I'd like to have the members of the board introduce themselves. Wayne? Good evening, Wayne Medinsky. Lynn Delahay. And again, I'm Dan Eknowski. John Brown and Virginia Tech is playing at 8.30 today. Marilyn won. <laughs> good evening, Rich Richardson. Uh, good evening, Steve Scott, board attorney. And also we have uh, joining us through a WebEx teleconference is Guy Bradley, the alternate member for the Board of Appeals. There are several members in the audience here that are from, from the St. Mary's County government supporting staff. And they are Bill Hunt, the Lugum Director, Harry Knight, Deputy Director of LUG at Land Use and Growth Management, Stacy Clements, Planner 3, and Neil is not here, okay. but the county attorney is. Dave, uh, Dave's here. Uh, uh, also joining us in the Savage Conference Room is Sherry Young, the Board of Appeals Recording Secretary. WebEx Conference also, I, do we have John Dietrich here? Mr. Mills is on the line. And then we have, instead of the uh, Director of Public Works, we have Donnie Mills. Um, we have one public hearing tonight and the case, or case on the agenda. And it is ZAAP 201320006 Millstone Landing 711. Before we start the, the hearing, for the viewers at home, you will be able to see the staff and applicant presentations on Channel 5 or YouTube as these presentations are being shown. You can also see the documents that have been submitted for these case by going to board docs. Ms. Clements will now demonstrate how to locate and use board docs. Okay. Good evening. Let's see, share. Google Chrome. Um, just verifying we're sharing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nope. 
Pardon? The screen went dark, and now it's over here. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. Well, you need you need that screen over here. here too. Yeah. There you go. Now. Mm-hmm. I just want to make sure that's up. There yeah, we go. So it matters. Sure. Sure. Share it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. There we go. We would, um, in order to view all the documents on board docs, we need to go to St. Mary's, S-T-M-A-R-Y-S-M-D.com. And once you're to the St. Mary's County homepage, you want to hit the tab that's labeled board docs up at the top. Okay. It'll take a moment for it to load. It's a large program. Okay. Once we're loaded, we want to pick out tonight's meeting. We are looking for Thursday, March 11th, Board of Appeals meeting. And here we have Thursday, March 11th, also verified here on the left. We go down into the center, we can view the agenda. And on your left hand side, we can see the public hearing for Millstone Landing 711. <laughs> You pull that up and all the agenda items will um, show up on your screen. Okay, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, we'll begin the presentation tonight with the staff uh, giving the presentation and Stacy and Harry, will you both be participating and be sworn in? Okay, if you stand please and raise your right hand. <clears throat> Do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. And whoever's taken off, take off. Okay. <laughs> okay. And we're going to Microsoft. There we go. Okay, tonight we're hearing for a public hearing for March 11th, 2021, or 2021. <laughs> we are going to hear a zoning application, um, appeal, zoning appeal, 20-132006, uh, Millstone Landing 711. Um, the applicant is requesting to appeal a decision of the Planning Commission. On December 16, 2020, the Planning Commission denied the concept approval for the proposed convenience store fuel sales canopy and a car wash. The property was posted and legal ad was printed in the local Southern Maryland news on February 19, 2021 and February 26, 2021. All the neighbors were notified within 200 feet of the property before the cutoff date of February 24th, 2021. Okay, tonight's hearing is a request for concept plan approval. This is to be heard de novo, which means it's a fresh start, a new hearing begins. Therefore, staff enters the following attachments as seen on board docs into the record. We have the um, land use and growth management staff report to the planning commission. We have the concept site plan, the color renderings and sign signage plan, the landscaping plan, state highway comments dated 7-16-2020, a turn lane extension plan, traffic study uh, dated 9-11-2020, we also have the revised adequate public facilities application dated 10-23-2020, state highway comments dated 10-29-2020, and email to state highway 11-11-2020. The email response from state highway to, uh, on 11-12-2020. 
We also have DPW's traffic impact study memo dated November 12th, 2020 and state highway plat number 54770. Would you like to review any of those before we continue on? You're talking about this slide? Any of out? the... Um, oh, the other slide. Mm -hmm. No, I, I want you to get you on that slide. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the board must find... Um, whoops. Now what did I do? <laughs> Oh, you took it away. I know. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Let's find the findings. Are we seeing it up there? No, okay. She's just taking us off the... Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Uh, the findings must the board must find that the proposed development meets is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable functional plans b may be served by adequate public facilities as required by section 70.2.2 c is consistent with the county's annual growth policy including all required phasing plans d will promote the health safety welfare of the general public E, adequate development, recreational, and other community amenities are provided in accordance with the comprehensive plan and the comprehensive zoning ordinance. Also, F, is consistent with Chapter 62 design objectives. Yep, and that was it. Yep. Okay. Oh, that is our me? presentation oh, okay. for Mr. Chairman, tonight. Mr. Chairman, I got a question. Sure, go ahead. Okay, item B up there may be served by adequate public facilities as required by section 7.2.2. And maybe I was going to ask council for his opinion on this, but as the planning commission, we must find that the proposed development may do as that bullet says. However, Paragraph 70.2.2 states, for site plans, adequacy ter determination shall be made at final site review. There appears to be an inconsistency in the comprehensive zoning ordinance. In other words, what, what this commission, since we're acting as that, and then what Mr. Hunt's function would be. So is, is there an ambiguity? I realize the operative word it, it is may be served up there, but I just want to, you know, because if he's the decider, why are we here? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, and I I believe this came up on a uh, a similar case not too long ago, and the word may be served by adequate public facilities. I think that's a an initial finding based upon the record that we're able to make, and I believe this has gone to technical evaluation right, committee exactly. and that, that that initial finding has been made. So we are first first person in the in the tunnel as far as making a decision. That would be one of the elements of our in other words it would go through we would, we would be a decision maker or if it went got passed on then Mr. Hunt would ultimately be. Okay. Yeah that is specifically from section of the ordinance oh, yes. 60.5 and um, the uh, concept plan approval 60.6.4 A through F. Um, I would agree that there does seem to be a little inconsistency because it says for concept approval it's per that 70.2.2 and then we go to that and it says planning director. But this is the list for what the planning commission has to find for concept plan approval. Okay, I just want to get that cleared up on the record, okay? Um, the other question I have maybe of council first before an answer, but is it appropriate for me to ask why of the six criteria, was there one or several that the um, planning commission had had issues with. Would that be appropriate to ask that question? So, so that's a question of of evidence and what comes before us from an evidentiary point of view. 
and questions of evidence per our rules are, are um, determined if there's, a, if there's an issue or concern are determined by the chair. And our rule 5-104A, generally the chair may admit evidence which possesses, possesses probative value commonly accepted by reasonable and prudent persons in the conduct of their affairs. So um, in my opinion, that's a fair question. What, uh, what happened at the Planning Commission, even though this is a de novo hearing, that's a factual issue that's, um, that has, has occurred in this case in other proceedings. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's, uh, that that's, uh, that's uh, dispositive of the case from our point of view, but it's an interesting fact. Now, again, that's up to the chair to determine whether or not that's something that you want to admit into evidence or you want to proceed with or have questions about or accept factual information about. Well, the, the, the summaries of the Planning Commission meeting, their minutes, they were included in the record for in the us record. here. Yeah, that's right. So in order to make up those, what's, what's in that um, uh, minutes, I think we have to know what those other items were. But the minutes only indicated how they voted. It did not state the reason th that they overturned or, or disapproved. And also, I think we'll, uh, of course, if this we'll... case goes forward, we need to provide documentation as to which way we go and why. I would also suspect that we'll hear some of that from the applicant because obviously the applicant is the appellant here and and um, has reasons and rationale for appealing this from the Planning Commission's uh, proceedings other than the fact that it just wasn't approved. I think they'll also want to get a little more specific about why the Planning Commission was wrong about their decision in their view. But can staff answer that question? <clears throat> certainly can. They were yes. part of the... If the chair chooses to allow it, certainly. Sure. Okay. Well, I would feel that you somewhat answered that question, that if by looking at that record, the minutes did not clearly state what the reason the Planning Commission disapproved it, um, and that's the written record. So I wouldn't want to offer conjecture about why the Planning Commission disapproved it if it wasn't put in a written record decision by the Planning Was Commission. Was there anybody in this room Commission. that was there? Was there anybody in this room from Lugham or council that were there? Um, I watched it, but Mr. Hunt? Mr. Hunt, may I swear you in? Please raise your right hand. Do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. I heard the question. Okay. The answer to the question, from my perspective, is that the entire record of the Planning Commission meeting was captured on video. That, to me, is the correct source for the answer to your question. Asking me or any other witness who was at that meeting is going to be uh, a spontaneous response based on memory without being able to look at that and it's going to potentially be prejudicial one way or the other. It's not the way to get at the facts. The way to get at the facts are to look at the record of the hearing, which is the video record. Now, my question is, normally when we have a discussion, we say why we want to go one direction or the other. What you're telling me is it appears that they never stated that. Well, no, sir, I would not want you to interpret what I'm telling you as meaning that. Now, is that, I don't see that in the record. Is it in the record, that video? The video is the record of the hearing. Is it in the record as presented here? Our record that's in front it's, of us as it exhibits. It's on board docs. On board docs, is it a part of this case? That is my question. For your attorney, not for me. <clears throat> Speaking on behalf as Lugham's attorney tonight, um, th there's two types of hearings. There's a on-the-record hearing and there's a de novo hearing. If this was an on-the-record hearing, then you would look at what the Planning Commission did and determine whether or not they did it correctly. A de novo hearing is when you hear it brand new. 
So you should not consider what the Planning Commission did. What you guys are going to do is hear the same evidence, sit in the Planning Commission's roles, and make a decision. But you know you shouldn't be watching board docs and seeing what the Planning Commission did, because that's not evidence. What's evidence is what the applicant's about to uh, present to you, but it's a brand new hearing. So I, you know, from the county's perspective, you shouldn't be delving into what the Planning Commission did. Okay, the did. county has one position, our board attorney has another. I'm just I'm giving just you the- being aware, the, okay. Just giving you the county's position. I just want to, so the bottom line is there is no response or no answer to that question. No, Mr. Brown, I purposely did not, um, in our staff presentation to you, <clears throat> I purposely presented to you those attachments that Lugum staff had presented to you. Well, I'm sorry. I purposely presented to you in the staff report those items that Lugum had presented to the Planning Commission for the previous hearings. <clears throat> um, I feel strongly as a de novo hearing, you are supposed to be hearing everything new and not rehashing the old case. And um, I'm, I'm, that's my answer to your question. And I think, uh, Mr. Brown, I think Mr. Weiskopf and I were really trying to, well, we were saying more the same thing than you might have realized. And my answer is if the chair chooses to allow some of that uh, factual or some of that uh, uh, um, information from below, it shouldn't be dispositive of your proceedings because you are a de novo board here as you sit. Uh, but it really is up to the chair if it's probative to allow it or not allow it. Now, the question is, and I think one of the things Mr. Weiskopf was wondering is, what value is it to really sit and, and, and watch that proceeding because you're not bound by it and you shouldn't be uh, making your determination based upon it anyway? And, and I'm Does that make sense? Or Mr. Weiskopf and I speaking in circles. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a mask on. He can't tell whether he's playing or not. <laughs> and I would agree with Mr. Hunt, his, his excellent answer that, um, you know, I, w I watched some of it. I wasn't in the room, but I watched it. Um, and, but again, I shouldn't try to tell you tonight based on recollection. Bec that wouldn't be fair. There also may be new evidence presented at this new hearing that was not presented at the past um, hearing. Hearings. Mr. But I just want to make the point, really, that the minutes do not reflect, of that commission, do not reflect the reason that it was disapproved. They, just, they have the names, their votes, and that's it. <clears throat> it. What it wasn't was approved, and so there was, what the minutes show was there was a motion, and the motion received a second. It, it failed did. to get a majority vote, and so it, in essence, died on the table. Yeah. Mr. Chair. Th thank you. That's all I wanted to get out of somebody. As, as a, another member of this board, I respectfully disagree with Mr. Brown. I think that the fact that it was uh, published and read out loud that this is a de novo case, which means a fresh start. I, I personally wouldn't want to be uh, president, uh, you know, persuaded by something that I've watched. Mm -hmm. So I think we're chasing a rabbit hole here and probably need to move forward. I would say I would agree. I would agree with that. I think we should to go forward with a de novo hearing. Um, we got the. I got the answer I wanted right here. Okay. Mr. Sorry, Knight. it took so long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, I have, I have a question. Sure. Uh, on the list of attachments, about the fifth one down is the State Highway Administration, dated 16 July 2020. Could you pull up the attachment, please? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's see. Which one is um, the fifth one down on the staff attachments? Okay, staff attachments. State Highway, July 17th or July 16th. Okay. There we go. Okay, we've got it pulled up for you. Uh, how about the the, the attachment? which this starts out with District 5 traffic comments. Should be the third page down. You got the attachment to that? 
Mm -hmm. I, I think you have the letter. The next one down is the carbon copies, who it was sent to, and then the next page below that would be the attachment that we're talking about. There you go. That's it. District 5. Now what you're looking for? The one with Ray Mercado. Yes, sir. That's it. Would, would, would the look at paragraph 6 of the first, first Excuse paragraph. me, Mr. Chairman. If I may, the screen that I have up from the county still has the PowerPoint and not the exhibit you're looking at. Oh. Gotcha. The question I have is this, this paragraph six, and I will not read the whole paragraph, okay. but she said, depending on the length of time when the restaurant has been ceased operation, the net okay. development trips yep. and the traffic general report could be 2,498 instead of 1,193. What does that really mean? That she's just taking a guess out of the air? She just double it and add 112? What is, it, what is that based on? Are you asking me, sir? <laughs> Could be 2,498 trips instead of 1,193. Where's that coming from? So I, I would not try to characterize or interpret the state highway document. I think it would more be more appropriate and um, within the rules that they could subpoena a state highway person, could they not? Um, certainly we, we have that subpoena power, sure. Um, I wonder if the applicant may be able to uh, address that with their traffic engineer. Okay. Yeah, it just seems strange to just out of thin air double it and add 112. I see no basis of, of actual numbers or figures. I wish I could help you with that. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Considering that the Google satellite was wrong. You ready to go? Board, have any other questions? <laughs> they will be available for questions later. Um, next, I guess we will have the applicant go ahead and make their presentation. And Chris Longmore, I think you will be leading the charge. Is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I will begin this evening. <clears throat> and then we have other members of our team that will present the engineering and application itself. I, I will say, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if you can hear it in the room, but there's a strong delayed echo um, for those of us logging in online. I, I believe we've had that before. I don't know if there's a way to, to, our to change side that because I can hear my words. We're going to try to adjust our audio. <clears throat> I'll put we hear on. you loud Thank and you. clear. And what if this is unusual? I, I hear my own words about a second and a half after I say each one. That That's much better now, I believe. Okay. Now we can. Now we can. Thank you. <laughs> and can I still be heard in the room? Not as well. Not, try, try a little closer to your microphone. We're, we're is this to get him off? Uh, it's in my ear, okay, so okay. I can't we're get okay. much closer. <laughs> is that better? So I'll try to speak speak loudly if that assists, and and if you need to turn it up so you can hear me, I'll just try to deal with the echo. But it's kind of strong tonight, stronger okay. than it's been other hearings. That's good. That's good. I think. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so what what we would like to do tonight is I'll start with a brief presentation and um, uh, about where we're at in the process, and that may answer some of the questions or at least give our perspective on some of the questions that the board members raised initially and then i'll turn it over um to our engineers in our presentation group to give you the the details of our proposal i'm, I'm going to share with you a powerpoint that i have prepared for this evening to walk through uh, those initial points that i'll be making um, to begin with um, the general overview of the project and i know that this has been covered in the staff report to some degree is we're, we're here talking about the property located the address on three notch road you can see on the powerpoint slide before you in lexington park um, it, it the property is zone mxm which is mixed use medium intensity um, the proposed commercial uses and i apologize i just noticed a typo on my slide they are allowed within the mxm is what that should read um, and they include convenience store fuel sales and motor vehicle maintenance service are the three uses as identified by staff and by our engineers 
um, as to what is being proposed here. And again, my, my client will go into further detail um, about the project and the details of that later. I will note also that this is a property within the Lexington Park Development District where, of course, our county has designated uh, the primary growth and commercial activity to be as one of the development districts. Um, and it is a, a site that is being redeveloped from prior commercial uses, as you'll hear uh, later in the presentation. Um, as to the procedural history of, of how we ended up here this evening, um, there was a question about whether it had gone through TEC review. It had been um, it was in the March 25th, 2020 cycle. Um, we were first before the Planning Commission in July of last year. Um, and then there was a second and a third hearing in September and November, uh, respectively. Um, and it was at that third planning commission hearing that um, we, we did not receive approval. And as mentioned by Mr. Knight, um, there was a motion made there to approve the application. It was seconded, uh, but it did not receive the adequate number of votes. Um, so, so I can be clear on the record since, since this is also a hearing that will have its own record. Uh, we, we respectfully agree that the the video from the last hearing doesn't really have any any relevance, and we think that the evidence presented here tonight should be the appropriate evidence. Um, I, I will note in addressing Mr. Brown's questions, and, and I think Mr. Knight and Mr. Hunt touched on this, is that from my experience at the Planning Commission level, they do not issue findings of fact um, in the same manner that this board does when, when this board decides a matter, whether it be an appeal or a matter of first impression, such as a variance. Um, my understanding of why that's the case is that, of course, any decision here tonight um, could be further reviewed by the circuit court. Uh, and the circuit court does require under a uh, very strong Maryland case law that this board have uh, findings of fact and conclusions of law supporting any decision you make tonight. So, so the um, we do not have a written decision either saying why the Planning Commission uh, denied our application or rather did not vote in favor of it. Um, but, uh, you know, we were certainly at the hearing and any perspective we can share we'll be happy to as we go forward tonight. Um, and of course, we're here uh, tonight before you with with our appeal, which was filed in December of last year. Um, the appeal process, as mentioned, and I won't uh, belabor this, the, the Board of Appeals rules govern, as Mr. Scott mentioned, and this is a de novo appeal, so you can consider all evidence uh, before you here tonight um, without any deference given the, to the Planning Commission's findings or decisions below. Um, the this is a concept site plan, and there's little discussion of this before, so again, I won't belabor it. Um, chapter 60 of the, of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance um, does set forth uh, the site plan review process, and I'll refer to a flow chart in a moment um, that may assist with, with kind of where we're at in the process. The Planning Commission is the, the board or the body that is vested with the authority to approve a concept plan but as was mentioned earlier in, in the question about final site plan approval, this is only one step in that overall approval process. And, and it is, as was correctly stated earlier, the planning director who is vested with the authority to approve any final site plan. Um, so if we are successful here tonight, and if the board sees fit to approve our application, which we're hopeful uh, you will, uh, my client still has several other steps it needs to go through in working with the county and state agencies, the TEC agencies, uh, to finalize the design, to finalize the engineering. And it will be the planning director in consultation with those um, agencies who, who will finally approve the site plan. That process is set forth in figure 21.1.A of the development of the flow chart found in the zoning ordinance. Um, this slide shows a, a clip from the zoning ordinance of that flow chart. And my next slide is kind of a blown up portion that applies to us tonight. This is considered a major site plan uh, since it is commercial activity um, being proposed. And, and where we are here tonight is that my client did submit its concept site plan and you are in the shoes of the planning commission 
in this third step in the flow chart, as you can see. Um, again, if we're successful, my client will have more engineering and work to do. There will be additional TC agency approvals that have reviewed more detailed plans that are drawn as appropriate in that step of the process. And then it's the planning director, and this is the chart right out of the ordinance, that will make the final site plan approval um, decision. And that does include final decision on all adequate public facilities, um, including traffic and the other public facilities that are mentioned um, in our ordinance. So again, your role tonight is really um, essentially not to be the, the Board of Appeals, but to be the Planning Commission looking at this as a site plan and determining whether we meet the site plan criteria um, for, the, for the presentation that uh, my clients will be making in a moment to you. Um, the concept site plan criteria um, is set forth in Section 60, as I mentioned, um, and it speaks about the Planning Commission uh, approving that before the major site plan can be processed by the planning director. Um, the, the six standards were, were set forth by staff I'll touch on those in a moment as well. Um, and then, you know, there are the other approvals that need to be obtained from the planning director at a later point in time, which again include the adequate public facilities. Uh, this is another excerpt of the zoning ordinance just to highlight it for the board. As I know, concept site plans are not regularly before you unless in, in the context of an appeal like this. Um, and this talks about the adequate public facilities determination because this does often come up um, as a question as it was as it did earlier um, and, and our you know position and i think the language of the ordinance clearly supports this is that the board tonight does not need to find that we do meet all the criteria of section 70.7 through 70.7 12, as you can see in the language of the ordinance here. What, what this board determines as far as adequate public facilities is that we may meet that based on the step in the process that we're in. And, and we believe most importantly, based on the TC comments, as Mr. Scott mentioned, um, that are in the record um, already as mentioned by staff. And I'll note, and my, my client will highlight this, there are no objections from any of the TC agencies for this site plan to be approved. The last slide I'll share with you and then I'll turn it over to, to the rest of our team um, is the six criteria that were mentioned to you before um, as um, our zoning ordinance states. I will say, and I don't believe um, there's um, a disagreement on, on this in any way. You can see the six criteria that are there. The third criteria that I'm circling there, um, as mentioned in, in the, I believe the staff report before the Planning Commission, that criteria is not applicable currently because the county has rescinded its annual growth policy and it is not in place. That was rescinded um, several or many years ago now. So that standard respectfully does not need to be met or just simply is not applicable um, anymore. And, and typically that was there for residential developments when there were concerns about school seats, um, you know, probably a decade ago. And, and that has not been in place for some time. So it's really the five other standards that um, we need to show you tonight that we can meet with this project we're confident that we can. We believe that this project is uh, very consistent with the five standards. And with that, I'll turn it over to our team um, so they can present our actual application. I will, Mr. Chairman, um, request that, you know, once my my team is presented and they've answered any questions that you have and we've, we've heard any public comment, um, I would appreciate the um, opportunity as is customary to pr present a summation and, and response to any public comments if there are any tonight. So I'll be speaking again at the end um, if, if the chair will allow me. That's so with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, unless the board has any questions for me, um, I can turn it over to our engineers, Jeff and Mike, and they'll uh, okay. begin their presentation. If, if you could, um, Mr. Longmore, if you could go ahead and have, uh, let us know who was going to be presenting for you and we can swear them in at one time. 
Sure, it, it may make sense for you, to, uh, Mr. Chairman, if we may. I, I know this has been done in the past. We, we have several presenters that will be um, presenting tonight. Um, pretty much all members of, of our team, other than myself, will probably be presenting either testimony or be available for questions. Um, so, if, um, Jeff and uh, Mike are, are the two that will begin um, tonight. Uh, but I know Betty Tustin is also planning uh, to present um, as as we go forward this evening. So Mike Rearman and Jeff Harmon of Becker Morgan Group and Betty Tustin of the Traffic Group will be the primary presenters tonight, although Bill Owen and Jason Donald of my client are also here to answer any questions, as well as Chantal Marino. I'm an architect that's assisting on the project if needed. Okay, for those for those three, for for right. Mike, Jeff, and Betty, if they would uh, stand and raise their hand, raise your right hand, please. Do you declare and affirm under the penalties of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd still like a question of Mr. Uh, Longmore. Longmore. Sure, go ahead. Um, in your discussion as it relates to the APF, are you suggesting that this commission has, at, in, in considering that we're de novo, really should eliminate that criteria out of the six? You've eliminated one because of the county, but they do talk about adequate public facilities. And what I'm hearing from you is, uh, let it go, Mr. Hunt will make that decision. Could you please amplify and no, clarify no. the grounds for that? Certainly, that, that is not what I meant to say. If that's how it came across, um, I'll be happy to clarify. The, the language of that um, provision states that the applicant must prove that they may meet the requirements of the of the chapter 70 which has i believe it's chapter 70.7 .7 through 70.12 and that includes all adequate public facilities including roads and traffic which are, are typically the one focused upon by the planning commission um, at, at concept site plan what i was trying to convey is that this board sitting as the planning commission does not make a final decision on whether or not um, this project meets all the criteria of Chapter 70. What this board must find is that we may meet the criteria that. Um, this is a concept site plan um, and not a final site plan. So all the engineering has not been done. All the final approvals have not been obtained because that's not where we're at in the process. Um, as the board may recall um, or, or may be aware, and if so, I apologize for for, um, for stating something that, that may, you may already be aware, but the county made the policy determination many years ago um, that they would rather the planning commission receive site plans early in the process at the concept phase um, instead of at the final phase where, where the planning commission could have been given that authority to make the final uh, decision. Um, as I recall from being involved in the process and, and in this line of work at that time, um, one of the concerns was that a lot of times applicants would get through all their final engineering, which could be rather expensive um, and a lot of work with all the different agencies that were there, only to get to the end and not know that there were concerns that could have been addressed earlier. Um, so they changed the process at that point. So this board does not need to find that we meet every criteria of Chapter 70 tonight. What it needs to find is that we may meet that. We suggest that the best, so you do need to make a finding of that. We're not saying that's a, an inapplicable element um, of those. That we've never made that argument. I've never made that argument before the Planning Commission or this board um, in any of the appeals we've had. What we're saying is that we need to show you that based on the TEC comments that you have before you and any other appropriate evidence in the record, that we may be able to meet that, the standards. Now, if there's one of the standards that we just clearly do not meet or that an agency says, no matter what you do, you're not going to meet this criteria, then I think it would be appropriate for you to say that we may not meet that because the agencies have said we can't. What we're here tonight with and why we were so surprised at the Planning Commission um, that, that it wasn't approved 
quite frankly, is that all of the TEC agencies have given positive comments um, to this site plan. Um, there are none that have expressed um, any reservations that would make it likely that we may not receive final approval based on our county ordinances and, and regulations. So it's just that you don't make the final decision on adequate public facility. You need to look at the criteria of a concept site plan, the, the information we're required to have in those plans, and say in your um, um, opinion and in your findings that we may meet that plan, that there is a good likelihood that we may meet that criteria, assuming all the final engineering is done and assuming all the agencies agree with any revisions we do when we do that final engineer. Thank you. Did, did, did that clarify uh, my, my question before, Mr. Edmonds? I think you have it any did. Other questions on that? May, if I may ask a question, if we go through the process, if you go through the process and you get approval here tonight for a concept plan, as you go through and develop the site plan, the final site plan, and you find out that one of those items you cannot meet now, say adequate public facilities. And therefore the zoning director, land use and growth management director turns down your approval. What's your course of action after that? At that point, we do not have an approved final site plan, so no uh, construction would be able to commence. My, my client would not be able to go in and obtain its building permits. Now there would, you know, and Mr. Scott can, can disagree with me or Mr. Weiskopf. That would be a final decision of the planning director. So if we thought he did not apply his criteria correctly, we would be able to avail ourselves of an appeal to this board and ask you to review what Mr. Hunt did in that situation, uh, as opposed to what we're doing here tonight, asking you to, to step into the shoes of the planning commission. Um, and decide that. But to be clear, Mr. Hunt, you know, even if we get the approval before you, this does not mean my clients have a green light to go and build their building and start business. They have other engineering, other approvals they need to meet. And the primary, primary one is having Mr. Hunt give us the final site plan approval after he gets all the other information he needs from my client and from the TEC agencies that will further review it after this concept site plan. We're, it really is early, you know, somewhat early in the process that a concept site plan is there. That, that's kind of inherent in the term. This is really the, the concept of development, not the final engineering. And that can always be difficult, I think, for the Planning Commission, and several members have voiced this on the record over the years, um, that they know this is kind of their only shot to look at it. Um, so um, they take that very seriously and and respectfully, in this case, we believe that that caused them to go beyond their authority and not approve it, because we think that, that our application does meet all the criteria that's there. But Mr. Hunt could, even if you approve it, Mr. Hunt could deny us later if we don't meet all the standards of Chapter 70 um, as set forth in those provisions that I showed you earlier. Thank you. I have one question. Um, one of the points of this, the sixth and final one is 62 design objectives. Could you go over that a little bit? That's the last one. I just wanted a little clearing on it. Certainly, and, and the, the other members of our team um, will be presenting kind of factually specific evidence to support that. Um, but our zoning ordinance does have design standards that apply for certain types of uses in certain areas of our county or certain certain uh, zoning areas of our county. That is found in chapter, I believe it's six, it is in 62, as you mentioned. Um, there, there are countywide design objectives. There are um, residential ones. There's ones that apply to townhomes. Uh, um, and 62.6 .6 would be the one I believe would be most applicable here, which are design standards applicable to commercial and mixed use development. Um, a lot of that um, and, and, you know, I, I'm a lawyer, not, not an engineer or an architect, so I don't want to uh, overstep my role, but a lot of those standards are, are set forth to have uh, development that is aesthetically pleasing, that is consistent with the rest of the neighborhood or area where the development is occurring. Um, it has provisions about, um, you know, not using all the same material, uh, breaking up, you know, 
wall so that, that visually they're appealing. And you'll see in our designs today, we believe that we can, um, you know, we can show you that, that I think this project we're proud of can, can certainly meet that. But those are the type of criteria that are found in Chapter 62. So someone in your team will touch on that as we go along? We will. That'll be okay. part of our, our presentation that, that okay. Jeff and Mike uh, take the lead on. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Who's first up? Uh, good evening. Um, my name, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Mike Ryman. I'm a civil engineer with Becker Morgan Group, Group principal engineer. Um, and I'm going to let Jeff pull up the PowerPoint. Hopefully you can. Yep, um, bringing it up now. Okay, does everyone see that? Yes. Yes. Hopefully everybody can see that. All right, uh, if we can go to the next slide, Jeff. A little bit of a delay, hold on. There we go. All right, great. Um, so a little introduction uh, of our team uh, we have with us tonight. Uh, Bill Owen and Jason Donald, uh, who are our clients with Pentex Ventures, the developers of the project. I've already introduced myself. Uh, Jeff Harmon, uh, who is operating the PowerPoint currently, is our project engineer and engineer of record for the project. We also have with us Betty Tustin, who is a professional engineer and traffic engineer with the Traffic Group, uh, who will be speaking on traffic-related issues. Um, and you've already heard from uh, Mr. Longmore, uh, who is representing the project. Our agenda for tonight, uh, introduction, which we just did, uh, we're going to do some history of the site. Um, we're going to do some zoning and site plan review, uh, which Jeff will handle. We're going to talk about the traffic study, traffic improvements. Uh, Betty will talk about that. And then I'll have a summary, uh, some opportunities for questions uh, at the end. Next slide. Uh, so what you're seeing here, and I apologize, I, I am getting a little bit of echo feedback, so uh, bear, bear with me. But um, you know, yeah. what you can see here is our site outlined in green, uh, located at the corner of Three Notch Road, 235, and Millstone Landing Road. Um, you can see that the site was uh, a golden corral um, and has access to 235 currently, a right in, right out, and a full access point uh, on Millstone Landing Road. You can see the associated building, parking, uh, et cetera. Next slide. Um, the site actually has evolved a little bit over the years. Um, this is a aerial photograph from 2007 uh, when it used to be a McDonald's. Um, you can see the McDonald's facility there. Uh, you can see the two access points, which are uh, in the same location as the Golden Corral. Um, you can also see that there has been fuel uh, fuel at this intersection in the past. There was an Exxon station uh, located on the corner there uh, and a small bank facility uh, that you can see at that location as well. One thing I want to point out on the McDonald's plan, and we'll talk a little bit about this when we get into our site plan, uh, you can see for the access off of Millstone Landing Road, uh, they have some parking spaces very, very close to the entrance uh, where cars could actually, as they were backing out of those spaces, would actually block the access. Um, our plan uh, remedies that scenario. I just wanted to, to bring that to everyone's attention uh, as we get into our site plan. But this is 2007. You can see the McDonald's and the Exxon. Uh, next slide. Um, in 2011, the Exxon was uh, replaced with the PNC Bank uh, on the corner. The mixed up, you can see the McDonald's is, is still there uh, in existence. Next slide. And then in 2013, uh, you can see a little bit better picture of the bank, the, the new bank. You can see where the new paving is that's there. Um, and you can see the Golden Corral that's under construction. <laughs> Uh, one of the questions earlier about the traffic comment from SHA, and, and Betty can expand on this 
in more detail was in some of the early correspondence with SHA, uh, they looked at the aerial photograph here uh, and they thought the Golden Crow was demolished. Uh, and that created some confusion from them as it related to what kind of existing traffic was, fr was from that facility. Uh, we clarified that with them as we worked through the process. Uh, and so we'll be able to expand on that as we talk about traffic, but that's where I believe that comment uh, is coming from, and the and the and that's an early letter uh, from SHA that has since been resolved, and, and we can talk more about that. Uh, but if you can go to the next slide, was that the one that, that said go, that had been demolished? Was no, that... it has not been demolished. No, no, no. no. They, the state made a comment that appeared to have been demolished. They're referencing that yeah, picture. Yeah, we. Yeah, yes no, I think I mean, we, we when we met with them after to talk about that, that that's what we got from them was that they that's what they they didn't realize that it was still there. They thought it was demolished, and they have some some criteria as it relates to how to count existing traffic from demolished facilities. Um, the one the one thing I wanted to point out on this is you can see that the Golden Corral is under construction, but the two entrances uh, are still being utilized. So the existing entrances for the McDonald's carried through to the Golden Corral in the same location. I just wanted to point that out. Uh, go ahead, Jeff, next slide. Um, and then this is 2018, so this is one of the most current aerials. You can see, uh, again, the Golden Corral is now constructed. The PNC Bank is still in place. Um, and actually, Golden Corral maintained, I, I pointed out the parking from McDonald's, uh, which was coming off of Millstone Landing Road. Uh, it's a little tough to see in this aerial photograph, but those parking spaces were still there as part of the Golden Corral. And if you were to go out there today, you'd see those. Um, and, and our plan does eliminate that, and, and we'll go through that when we get into the plan. But uh, this is the, the completed Golden Corral uh, as of 2018. Next slide. Um, I, I want to, with that, I want to turn it over to Jeff Harmon, uh, who is our project engineer. He's going to talk about uh, the zoning and the site plan review, and uh, we'll go from there. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so uh, this is our uh, site overlaid onto the um, comprehensive um, zoning map for the county there. It's a site of 3.24 acres in total. Um, it is currently zoned MXM, uh, medium intensity mixed use. Uh, we are located within the Lexington Park Development District. So by the county's comprehensive plan, uh, this is the desired uh, location for development is within the development district. Um, the project is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Uh, we're having retail sales. Uh, it's a considered a, a general use. Low intensity is designated in the plan. Uh, the tax parcel is map 43, grid one, parcel 332. We do not have any wetlands on site. Um, the prior use uh, is a restaurant. Uh, the site is currently vacant. Um, it is no longer under operation. And our proposed use is a convenience store, use type 48. Uh, it's a permitted low intensity use. Uh, also fuel sales. Uh, use type 60, it's a permitted low intensity use, and the car wash, which is considered a motor, motor vehicle uh, maintenance service, a minor use, uh, use type 62, and it is also a permitted low intensity use. Um, the site is served by uh, sewer by METCOM. Uh, we are designated S1, which is ready to serve. The site currently has uh, sewer on it. Uh, it has a pump station and a, a force main, which will be reused for this project. Um, and then the water is also by METCOM, and it is designated W1, and that means it is ready for service today. There is uh, planned service, or actually existing service on site. Next slide shows uh, the county's land use map. Uh, this just sort of shows how our site fits in with the uh, surrounding community. You'll see that there's a significant amount of other MXM uh, mixed use, medium intensity uses around us. So we fit in with the neighborhood and are consistent with the surrounding land uses. And so to go through some of the zoning here to uh, let you know what we uh, needed to comply with, um, for landscaping, per the zoning ordinance, section 62.8, uh, we are not within a scenic corridor, so that means that we do not have to have uh, uh, landscape buffers along the streets. Um, per section 63.2, uh, we are required to provide shade trees every 40 feet across the street frontages, and you'll see on our landscaping plans coming up in our presentation that we have complied with that. 
uh, per section 63.3, the site is adjoined on all sides by land zoned MXM. Therefore, we don't have any required buffer yards to adjacent uses. Uh, so those are not on the plans. Uh, parking lot landscaping is required, and we have provided it per section 62.3.6. Um, the lot must have at least a minimum of 20% landscape space. Uh, and we have, uh, it says 46 here, I missed it, corrected at one spot, we are at 44% actually. Um, and uh, we are well in excess of the required amount of uh, landscape space on the site. Um, the setbacks are 50 feet in the front, 10 in the side, 20 in the rear, and we exceed all of those setbacks significantly. The maximum building height uh, cannot exceed 100 feet. We're about only 21 feet, so we are well below the maximum building height. Uh, the convenience store is the tallest structure on the site. That's a little bit taller than the fuel canopy uh, with some of the parapets and things, and you'll see that architecture uh, a little bit later on in the presentation. Uh, the building is 5,300 square feet. Uh, it is a convenience store, um, and uh, the uh, fuel canopy is, uh, are the convenience um, the fuel canopy is 4,284 square feet under the canopy, and we have 911 square feet in the car wash. Um, the floor area ratio, we're allowed to have 0 0.6. Uh, we are a very low floor area ratio at 0.11, which just means that we're not trying to put too much building on the site. The site is plenty large enough for us to have all the required uh, open space that we need and parking and circulation. And so the building is appropriately sized for the site and we are well below um, our maximum allowable. Uh, for parking, uh, you'll see the calculations there. I won't go through all the numbers, but the summary is is that we're required to have 44 spaces and we have provided 44 spaces. Uh, and then we're also required to have a uh, loading berth uh, and we have provided one of those per the code. So here's our site plan. Um, I'll just kind of go over some of the elements of the plan here. And uh, hopefully everyone can see my mouse moving around on the screen. As Mike mentioned prior, uh, this is our entrance to Millstone Landing Road. This is the entrance location that has historically been there. It's the same entrance that was there for McDonald's. It's the same entrance that's there for Golden Crow. It is the same entrance that we're using for the 7-Eleven. Uh, as Mike mentioned before, we had parking immediately at the entrance in this uh, space along the southern side of this dry aisle, which has been eliminated. Also on the northern side of this drive aisle was all parking and that has been eliminated as well. All of that has been turned into green open space. And so now cars are able to enter and exit here without any kind of conflict from uh, parking maneuvers or anything. It vastly improves the safety and the operation of that intersection. Uh, as you come in from Millstone Landing here, uh, you'll see that the drive aisle wraps around. We have our loading berth uh, for deliveries. We have our trash enclosure. Uh, this is the general location on sort of the westerly side is where the seven or the uh, Golden Corral building was. The 7-Eleven building is going within that footprint, although it is a much smaller footprint. The Golden Corral was over 11,000 square feet and our building is 5,300. So it is a much smaller uh, use uh, than what was there before. Uh, also, uh, we have parking on the southern side and on the eastern side in front of the store. Our fuel canopy is in front of the store. We have underground fuel storage tanks to the north of the canopy. And we have some additional parking over here uh, adjacent to the car wash. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of vacuum spaces on either side of this island here for people to vacuum. Um, and we have a entrance into the car wash and the exit is on the far side. Um, there is a bypass lane if anyone were to get in uh, to the uh, car wash area and did not want to go through, they would be able to exit without having to reverse out. Uh, the parking on the uh, southern side of the building has been moved back further from the road than where the original parking was. Uh, and what that provides for is uh, an enlarged entrance here to improve safety coming in. The existing entrance is rather narrow and can be uh, somewhat difficult for cars coming in and out. We provided a traffic separator island that's been improved and um, a widened entrance so that uh, we can improve separation between the vehicles entering and exiting and uh, further support that right in, right out maneuver to uh, direct people to go the direction they're supposed to. So uh, all in all, traffic circulation's been improved on site. Um, you'll see many stormwater features here. 
Uh, these uh, sort of dashed oblong shapes are all the existing stormwater features that were designed for the site. We are retaining all of those. And uh, I'll speak just a little bit here in a minute on uh, why we kept those and why that's a benefit. So um, here's our, here is our benefit. Um, it, what we're able to do is all of the areas that you see shaded in our rendering that's green are areas that are new open space. All these spaces used to be a uh, parking lot, pavement, building coverage. So this site vastly increases the amount of open space. Uh, we have actually added almost a half an acre of new pervious uh, uh, landscaped area on the site. Uh, we were required to have 20% open space. We achieved 43.7, so 119% more open space than is required. Um, you'll see along our rendering here where we've added all of our street frontage trees that were required by the landscaping code. Um, we have trees along this frontage as well, adding interior landscaping plantings. Uh, and this plan in the rendering shows the major trees, but we also have other foundation plantings and beds and things like that as well that don't show up well on uh, this scale, scale of a rendering. Um, and one other thing I know that um, uh, many municipalities like, uh, and in the county also, I've, I've heard them ask for this before too, is uh, cross access to uh, the adjoining property to the north as well. So uh, we have provided that and been working with that neighbor there as well. Jeff, can you talk about, Jeff, it's Mike, can you talk about the stormwater facilities? Yes. Those stormwater facilities were designed for the previous amount of impervious under the current rules? Can you talk a little bit about that? Correct. So we have bioretention. All of those are landscaped uh, bioretention, meeting the uh, most recent Maryland Department of the Environment regulations for stormwater management to increase water quality. We elected not to remove any of them. So as Mike mentioned, uh, we have far exceeded the capacity that would be required for the amount of impervious coverage on our site. So what that does is it allows us to clean the water better than it was before. You'll notice that there's a, a large culvert existing that goes under the site. You can see the head wall on the north and the head wall on the south there, and there's a stream north of us. Uh, by maintaining all of those uh, oversized, uh, environmental uh, friendly, uh, facilities, we are also able to further reduce the amount of runoff from the site. So that reduces the amount of water released into those streams and uh, helps the downstream and improves uh, the flow through culverts. And so it's an overall benefit uh, to the community through uh, releasing less water from the site and cleaning it more than we're required to. So um, let's see, I think that's uh, all I was going to talk to on this slide. Uh, so moving on here, um, one of the concerns um, that you know we need to look at on, on any site is uh, site distance. And so on the entrance on Millstone Landing Road, we wanted to ensure that it was uh, safe for exiting vehicles. We are adding additional trees. Uh, so we have kept those trees back from the property line. You'll see the area in yellow is our site distance triangle. And that area is clear of any uh, kind of blockages. There are uh, no signs. There are no tall landscaping. There are no buildings. There are no fences. Um, there is clear site distance all the way to the intersection of uh, 235 and Millstone Landing Road. So uh, people have more than adequate uh, sight distance and visibility uh, to see traffic uh, to make a safe maneuver coming out of that entrance. Um, the number there, 390 feet, is what's required by AASHTO, which is the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials. Uh, that is, uh, we call it the Green Book, which is sort of the Bible for highway design. And uh, that is the national standard. And uh, M.SHA SHA has adopted that as well. And that's what we're required to meet. And uh, we have met that. Excuse me, Jeff. And I'll turn this it over to Betty at this time. Excuse me, Jeff, if I can have a question. Yes. This is Dan Ignacy. Yes. Um, for the site distance plan you have, you show it going through a green area on the adjacent property. Is that within the right of way, or do you have an agreement to keep that um, cleared? 
that is all within the right of way. Um, you'll see on our site plan, our property line is in blue. That property line extends, uh, doesn't exactly follow parallel with our yellow line because it curves around the corner more. Uh, the property line is pretty much uh, right behind the curb line there, the parking lot on the neighbors. So that's SHA right away. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'll take over from here. Thank you, Jeff, for, for bringing that slide up. In order to determine or project how many trips, new trips um, a particular development will generate, we use information that comes from the Institute of Transportation Engineers Trip Generation Manual. And the last um, edition of that Trip Generation Manual, they added a new category called the Super Convenience Car Wash. And that's what we know as the Wawa's, the Royal Farms that have become popular, particularly in the Mid Atlantic region. And so our proposed 7 Eleven uh, does fall into that category. A super convenience car wash usually has some uh, food items that are that can be purchased and taken out um, that are ready to go, and that's a, it's a definitely generates more trips than the previous trip generation rates that we use just for what we call a convenience car wash. So when we um, look at the the trips that we project to be generated by the 7-Eleven, we are uh, we are projecting a very conservative, a very high uh, number of rates for this category of convenience markets. Next slide. Betty, Betty, it's Mike. So yes. can you talk a little bit about, I guess, they're super convenient with car wash and then they're super convenient with the Laredo taco roof and the chicken. And, and that is because they're in this in this 7-Eleven, similar to how Wawa sells subs and sandwiches and Royal Farm sells chicken and all those types of foods. This 7-Eleven has a interior restaurant component known as the Laredo taco and the roost. And one of the questions that came up was, well, what if you looked at this as either super convenient with a car wash, meaning all 5,300 square feet, how much traffic does that generate? And what if you look at it as a super convenience with a car wash at 3,200 square feet and the remaining square footage, which is associated with the interior restaurants? So we did look at that. And Betty, you can confirm that actually the super convenience with car wash at 5,300 shows a higher trip generation than breaking it out. And that is what we used moving forward, meaning that we utilized a more conservative uh, computation for generating traffic for the application. Is that right, Betty? That's correct, Mike. Um, the, the super convenience and car wash based on the larger 5,300 square feet does generate more traffic than if we were to break it, break it down into two uses and separate the convenience market from the restaurant use. So again, we are using the most um, conservative, the higher trip generation rates that are provided. All right. Excellent. So, do you in? Excuse, this is John Brown. So, did you break it out in your in your uh, traffic study? What happened for each one, or did you just choose one? We chose the worst case. We typically use a what is the worst case scenario. We look at the peak hour, which is the worst case, worst hour of the day. Um, it's kind of like building in a safety factor. If we feel like we could accommodate the worst thing that could happen, then uh, the rest of the day would be satisfactory. Okay, and I, it's the first time it appears because I'm in all the discussions. I didn't see where restaurants were mentioned. Now you've got Laredo and and the other roost chicken yeah the roost chicken yeah. uh, what type of restaurant or accommodations or fast food what is that is it a go to the counter and it's already prepared or is it and people carry it out or is it a sit down how does it work so it would be similar it would be similar to if you were to go into some of the royal farms they've got a couple of tables off to the side you go to the counter you order the food you can take it out with you or you can sit down and, and eat it so it's um, like it's McDonald's. Not a restaurant in that there's so it's no uh, different not different than McDonald's. it could be similar to that yes you could correct uh, uh, will, but it's not will, table service with servers will, will you have a carry out service a drive through too or you have to go no. in yeah. Yeah. Say again. 
No drive through. No okay. drive through. How many actual so, tables and stools or whatever will they be? Uh, Bill, I may have to defer to you on that. I don't have that plan right in front of me. I know I can pull it up. Bear, bear. We actually have the, arch the architect on that might be able to answer that exact question. Well, whenever you get to that part of it. <laughs> okay, we might, is it okay if we should go back on that? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, but just to, to reiterate, we did look at it in two different ways. We looked at it as a super convenience with a car wash, like a Royal Farms, as Mike said, which has the counter service, or a Wawa, which you know has the counter service as well. Very similar setup. It's just this is the Raider Taco and, and Ruth Chicken, which is something um, for 7-Eleven versus a Royal Farms Chicken. And so we did look at it, combining it all in one super convenience and car wash with these food food sources and then we divided it out as well. And it turns out that the, the super convenience of car wash generates more trips than it would be if we separated them out and called one the restaurant and one a convenience store. So we are looking at the worst case um, scenario. We're projecting the worst amount of traffic that, that we anticipate there. All right, all right. moving on. So again, these are these are trips that are um, projected by the, the trip manual that we use. Again, we look at the at morning and evening peak hours because if we can accommodate the traffic volumes during the worst part of the day, then the rest of the day uh, will be satisfactory. And we um, the data that we use to do our analysis is based on. on um, data from 2019, which was used in the Lexington Ford traffic impact study. So that was when the Golden Corral was operating and the restaurant was operating. So we were we subtracted those trips from that 2019 data um, so that we don't double count our trips and the restaurant trips. So what the bottom line is, again, looking at the evening peak hour, because we found that that is the worst peak hour of the day, uh, we will add 49 more trips to um, are to to the intersection, uh, including the right in right out on on 235, uh, which boils down to about a little bit more than a one percent increase in traffic volumes at this intersection. Oh, um, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Uh, the, this slide shows the um, report County. that the staff report that we received, which um, Ms. Tustin, Mr. Richardson has a question. Yes. Uh, okay. Tustin, are you familiar with St. Mary's County? I'm sorry, I have to turn up my volume here. Are you familiar with St. Mary's County? Excuse me. Rich, Closer we'll to your mic. To you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, what's the question? <laughs> there we go. I'm sorry, are you familiar with St. Mary's County? Yes. yes. Okay, it's my understanding that the economy is pretty much based on the base the Navy base and the supporting uh, contractors. Uh, I go to the base quite often, and I don't know who else has access to the base, but the base is a ghost town. You go by the Moffat building, and there's four or five cars there. Uh, mm -hmm. If you go to Exploration Park and the place across the road, there's empty parking spots all over, and there's vacancies in the building. Most of those contractors have got leases that are three and four years long, so we cannot estimate when they'll be renewed or if they'll be removed. Many of the people who worked on the base haven't been to the base in a year. Uh, some of them go in a couple times a week, and of course there's a few that go in. But the traffic is greatly reduced. Uh, they're hiring people to work remotely, from other parts of the country that will never ever come to St. Mary's County. Some of the people that are working remotely have been told that they'll be working remotely indefinitely. And the base is concerning which buildings to close up indefinitely. So I don't put a lot of 
credibility to the traffic study because I think it's the traffic has ground down considerably. And that includes the peak times because now if the people that do go to work don't have to be there at seven o'clock or 7.30. Uh, I think you'll find that the traffic is greatly reduced. Thank I don't disagree with you. Um, in fact, in our in our traffic engineering profession, we are all kind of in a muddle because we will never. I don't. In my opinion, we will never return to the traditional morning and evening peak hour that we once had. Um, when all the COVID um, pandemic settles out, the people will have made definite changes in their work patterns, and that will make a big difference in our profession. But for this particular study, the, we couldn't collect new data because number one, as you said, it was reduced. Number two, we don't know what level it's going to go back to. Um, so we are using 2019 data, uh, which was before COVID when the base was more operating as it normally did. And, um, it's, and so it could very well be, I, have, I really can't predict the future, whether traffic volumes will go back to the way they were, or as you suggest, perhaps they never will. Um, but we are looking at what we would have looked at it in 2019 before we knew anything about the coronavirus. Yeah, thank you. I, I think the, Chairman, uh, my crystal ball is a little clearer than the one in, in 19, because the traffic is greatly reduced. Thank you. Uh, this is John Brown. I have a follow-on question. Is, um, so what you're saying is the traffic study, how many times has that been updated while you've been in this process for the last year? Any or some or one, two, three? Uh, for the for the 7-Eleven, the traffic study for the Yeah, for your traffic, for the, in support of the 7-Eleven initiative. Um, back in last summer, we had a, a smaller building, and then that was increased, and so the, the, um, we modified our traffic study. Our traffic study that you have before you is based on the 5,300-square-foot building with a car wash. Um, but I, if you look back at uh, some reports from July, that those were had a smaller building, and so the traffic... Okay, so, um, what the, 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 so the date of that report is the date of... The last traffic study, correct? Yes. Um, but Betty, I think it's important to point out that the existing traffic that was utilized as the base for the study was from the 2019, 2019. data, which was the the data that we had pre-COVID, which was higher traffic, as has been said. Um, so I all that was updated was the square footage of the building, uh, we don't go out and collect new data. I, we did not go out and collect data when traffic was depressed. It was collected when it was, I'll call it pre-COVID or normal. Mm -hmm. My follow-on question is, um, is along those lines and what Mr. Richardson just mentioned, nobody, have you ever gone as far as preparing this to the base and asked for what their plans were? Because obviously they are contracting and people that all the employees are being told, you know, what kind of spaces they'll have or not. And they're sort of hot bunking, hot desking uh, their spaces and they're contracting. So I didn't know if anybody had gone to the base to see how they saw their, shall we say, commuter traffic or, or the amount of people or spaces mm -hmm. that would be available on a given day. Well, certainly we could go and ask those questions and make those surveys, but then we'd have to make a lot of assumptions as to. Well, you're making traffic. assumptions now. Yeah. You're you're equating the uh, the Ford dealership to to uh, the Millstone site. So what's the difference? And one crystal ball is the same as the other, isn't it? No, no. Excuse me. Maybe uh, I wasn't clear. We base our traffic study on on. Count, turning movement counts that were conducted in 2019. Um, those are hard counts. Those are counts that were conducted before before COVID, when the base was fully operational. So analysis that we do are going to be based on volumes that existed two years ago in 2019, went before COVID. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Sure. Can you hear me? It's Bradley. 
Yes, sir. And you are? Oh, this is Guy Bradley. Um, have you haven't been sworn in? Mr. Bradley. Um, He's the alternate. He's the alternate. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. The Excuse me, Guy. He's what? The alternate. Is there alternate? Our alternate. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh. So, Mr. 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 Chair, uh, the al the alternate is um, sitting as an observer, essentially, uh, so is not a part of the of the uh, of the uh, the board for okay. this purpose, unless we needed the alternate tonight, and we did not. Okay, so you will not be able to ask a question this time. Sorry, guy. All right, then I got a question about that after the meeting because that's not the way I read the rules. Copy. Okay, so I, I just want to review. Um, when, when we did our traffic impact study, we based it on traffic volumes that were collected in 2019 because we did our study in 2020, and that was during a pandemic that's ongoing now. Uh, we could not collect traffic volumes then because they would not be reflective of what uh, w was when the base was fully operational and what could be uh, depending on what the base chooses to do in the future. So the volumes that we have are most likely higher than what you see out there today. Um, and, and so it's a very conservative analysis, very worst case analysis. Another question I have is there's a you allude to no more than 50 trips from the prior establishment, Golden Corral. Uh, Correct. Where did you get the data for that traffic study? All right, Jeff, you want to go back to the previous slide? And, and the, what, the, um, the information you see on the slide in front of you is based on a very complex equation that's been developed from studies of um, similar facilities, convenience markets uh, with gas pumps from all over the United States, primarily in the mid-Atlantic mid regions, because that's where we have the Wawa's, the Royal Farms, the sheets. Um, so this, that data is compiled and we project the number of trips that will be generated by a convenience market of this size with a car wash based on those complex formulas that have been developed and statistically verified. Um, and so we, what we find is that with a, with a gas station, with a convenience market, the majority of the trips are what we call pass-by trips. In other words, somebody's already on Maryland 235 and they need gas, so they just go into the 7-Eleven, get gas, and then they go on their way. Um, they're not somewhere else in St. Mary's County and said, oh, I need gas, so I'm going to travel 10 miles to go get gas to 7-Eleven when I could get at another gas station on my way. So the bottom line is, according to our, our um, trip generation projections, is that compared to the restaurant that was previously in use there, we're only going to add 49 more trips during the evening peak hour to Maryland 235 because uh, most of the trips that go to the 7-Eleven are already on Maryland 235. They're going to the base and they stop in the morning for gas or they come back and they stop you know, for coffee or for chicken sandwich or something. I'm sorry. And just to I... add to that, I, I wouldn't take, don't take our word for it. We have to submit this to uh, the Department of Public Works for their review. And Jeff, if you go to the next slide, they then respond to that and this is their response. And so they, they have to sign off on our generation. And you can see this is the response from their letter that the project generates less than 50 peak hour trips. Therefore, no traffic impact study would be required based on the threshold of peak hour trips. That being said, as we went through the planning commission process, there was a request that we do a study. Uh, we didn't think one was required. We did that for we did that anyway. Uh, so we've done the study anyway. So the 50 peak hour trips has to do with whether or not you exceed the threshold to do a study. Um, even though we believe we were under that threshold and it was not required by your code, we did one anyway. So it's a, it's almost a little bit moot in that threshold of 50, given the fact we did a study and we have submitted it for review. Please, please clarify. I thought the 50 was on top of 
what was the previous occupant, i.e. Golden Corral. And therefore, is, my question uh, is, if you're comparing two okay. organizations or buildings or facilities, one should be asking then, if you're compare, you've got your own data, but where did, what was the source of your data for the Golden Corral? Yeah, Betty can answer that. And I apologize, I'm having a really hard time hearing you guys. So if you're talking and I'm talking, I don't, I'm not doing it on purpose. Uh, it's just a little hard to hear. Uh, and Jeff, I guess go back to the previous slide. Again, the, the number of trips that we project for the Golden Corral for a turnover restaurant are again based on hundreds and hundreds of, of data sources that are, are generated and analyzed and put forth by the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Um, they are subject to strict statistical analyses. Um, Certainly, there is going to be a little bit of variation from a golden corral here to a golden corral in another area. But this is what the industry standard is, and this is what we use, and this is what's become accepted um, so, in our profession. So what you're, you used was what the golden corral told you? Is that what you're telling me? We use... We use um, complicated formulas and rates that are developed from studies nationwide um, on what a typical restaurant would generate on an average weekday peak hour. That's a simple question. What was the source of your data? That's the Golden key. Corral. That should be an easy the answer. Source, yes, the source of the, of the data is from the Institute of Transportation Engineers. So it's from a book. It's from a book based on, on dozens of studies nationwide of what a restaurant would generate. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Betty, if I can jump in for a minute just to clarify, um, is that um, analysis that you've done standard within uh, your field based on your experience? Absolutely. It's the standard uh, for the tra traffic engineering field. Okay. And, and that standard applies here in St. Mary's County Absolutely. as these numbers were, were reviewed by the Department of Public Works and Transportation, correct? Absolutely. So yes. this is what our regulations and rules tell you to do, right? You didn't make it up. up. That's what, what the rules require you to do when you apply for a site like this. Exactly. And it applies to any kind of or just about any engineering analysis. We use um, information from previous experiences to, to protect future uh, conditions that we design for. Thank, thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, Mr. Fine. Longmore, this Anytime. is Rich Richardson. Uh, I think St. Mary's County is unique and not like other places. I'm told that 80% of the revenue for the county is derived from the base and the facilities that support the base. That makes St. Mary's County totally unique compared to other places. And I'm here to tell you that the traffic is, is greatly reduced. Right. No, and, and I don't. I don't disagree with you, Mr. Richardson. I think um, what Ms. Tustin is trying to say is that um, the study that was done, the data that was collected, there were there were traffic counts done, and data was used in this analysis of 235 when the base was fully operational. So there were a lot of cars on the road when they counted the background traffic for Route 235 in doing this study. I agree with you wholeheartedly. There's not that many cars on the road now, which means that that there is less concern traffic-wise than there was when those counts were done. Uh, my client has done what the county and the state has asked everybody to do, is use the normal numbers You know, in the off chance that we do go back to normal. We want to make sure these are safe projects. We want you to pretend like there's still all that traffic on the road and you have to meet all the traffic standards as if there's still a ton of traffic going down 235 at night like it used to a year ago. Um, so right now there's not that traffic so we think there's even less of an impact or concern or a safety issue th than there would have been or probably never get back there like you said but even if it does we meet all the traffic standards that the state and the county has that that's kind of 
I, I think what what we're trying to combat. Yeah, we, 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 you and I are not, are not arguing. I think we both agree that traffic is much much less, and what you use is what Certainly. you had, uh, but it's it's greatly reduced. And what the new normal is going to be, all I know is, is that many people have been told they're going to work at home indefinitely. Yes. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, Shall we move on? Yes. Sure. Go ahead. Okay, we, we discussed this slide. And so um, when we were in our, dis in our discussions with the State Highway Administration, they asked us to look at the queuing on um, 235 as a, it's going southbound. And if you want to look at 235 as north or south, and to Millstone Landing. And based on um, our analysis, we have agreed to lengthen that left turn lane 100 feet. That's 50 feet for each lane. So that that's a safety and operational improvement that we have agreed to make. State Highway is fully on board with that and very thankful that we have agreed to do so. And this is an illustration of that lengthening of that turn lane. How many additional cars will that 50 feet provide? Um, it's 50 feet, two lanes. Typically, we say a car on the average is 25 foot, so that is uh, four, four cars. And that's, that's, of course, what you need during the cycle of just, the traffic. Cycle. It would just be four cars additional. Okay. Yes. And State Highway is um, on board with that analysis. Now, will that mean that that traffic light is going to have to be extended to get those additional four through? The traffic signal is um, is actuated based on demand. So, if if a, for a particular cycle of that traffic signal needs that extra couple seconds, yes, it would be. But but is that integrated with the fact that you would build that and that state would automatically reset it? Or you're telling me there's uh, a delay the in the process? No, there's no delay in the process. The signal timing right now is actuated by the vehicles that come up to the intersection and are read by the detector. So if more vehicles come up and are read by the detector, then then it provides for more green, generally speaking. So you're telling me there's sensors along that additional 50 feet that would tell you that cars are there? The detection right now is used is typically used by cameras that are on the poles, not in the roadway. All right, shall we move on to the next slide? Any other questions on that? Also, in order to minimize the impact that we have with the additional vehicles that we are going to be putting through that intersection, um, we have proffered to do a fee in lieu amount to, um, to the county, which can be used for the FDR project. And I believe the next slide demonstrates exactly how much that will be. Yes, we're increasing. Um, the CLV by 2.6%. The CLV is called the critical lane volume. It's a traffic engineering term. And that 2.6% will be applied to the $7.9 million project. Um, so we will be making a cash contribution to the county of $205,400 uh, for that FDR project. And just to add to this, the this is Act, this is what the uh, Lexington Ford project also did uh, for this very same intersection. Uh, they had also a, a fee and lieu, uh, which is one of the mitigation options available in the code under the adequate public facilities section. Um, and if you go back, you can see the from the letter uh, that we got that this is, go back, Jeff, one. Um, to the quote. So this is from the response from the Department of Public Works, uh, which basically says uh, that this is that we've determined the fee in lieu and that this is what has been used on other projects uh, along 235 and 3 notch quarter. Most recently, the Lexington Ford project for this very same intersection. Uh, we have followed that same precedent and process here. Um, I have a question, Dan McNasty, and I think it's probably to you, Harry. 
Where's the money go? Well, I think that would be more appropriately answered by Donnie Mills of the Department of Public Works and Transportation. Because it would be um, going, uh, if, if I understood what they said, it, um, um, for the FDR Boulevard project, there's an account if it was tied to the building permit, which it has been in the past, or more typically with the site plan approval, major site plan approval, not concept site plan approval. Um, <clears throat> we put it in an account number that's um, dedicated FDR mitigation. But again, Mr. Mills can more accurately then um, answer how it's spent. Mr. Mills, Donnie, would you like to swear in and then try to answer yep. that? You would raise your right hand. There he is. He's on. Thank you. Um, <laughs> do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. Thank you. So there is an account where this money goes into? Um, so I think here he is correct in saying that. I mean, um, I don't, uh, I'm going to say that I don't follow the actual account part, but what we have is a capital project that's been funded by the commissioners. And, and one of the condition is the project, um, for accepting, um, funds to a, to a county project. It has to be 75%, um, funded by the commissioners or funded by for the project and that this FDR Boulevard is fully funded and the um, as far as as far as like where the money would go I believe that it would go straight to the construction um, construction account line item in uh, under FDR okay thank you I have a question. Um, Wayne. It, the amount is 200000 more or less. Does that include the actual cost of doing the work on the state highway? The, 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 the actual queuing? The ex, you know, the, there's going to be more asphalt and whatnot, right? Well, as I understood it, this money is in addition to the state highway improvement. So this is a fee in lieu that was based on a percentage of the, if I understood correctly, the overall cost of the super convenience store with car wash. That is correct. And so, so. This is a completely separate. This is in addition to the required state highway improvement. And correct. As, Mr. Mills was saying it, it is right here in the zoning ordinance 70.7.2B. The county or state is programmed for construction in a capital improvement program or similar plan, at least 75% funded. Um, that's that's the section of the zoning ordinance he was referring to. Um, I think I'd probably rather hear it from the applicant. Um, Very good, sir. Because um, once, once they are recorded saying it, I'm... I feel better. Excuse me. Yeah, Mike, Mike or Jeff, can can you clarify on the record that there's the fee in lieu, and then that is in addition to the to the traffic improvement to, to add the queuing link. Yes, yeah, we have a, add that to the record. We have a separate cost estimate that we've submitted to SHA for review and approval for bonding purposes. So the amount of the construction of the uh, improvements to the uh, turn lane on 235 are separate and it is not included in the $205,400 number. Okay, thank you. But did I hear Mr. Mills say that, that it was already fully funded? So that... That's why the money would basically go to a general PW fund? Not a general fund. It would go to the FDR um, mitigation fund, which means but, that but if you that said it was already funded. Well. So then why do I need additional money? Because the commissioners could then reallocate what they've already put in that fund to different Oh, use. it's a dice game or pillow game. Okay. Squeeze here, squeeze there. Okay. So if, if the traffic has gone down, as I suggested, why is mitigation required? I 
believe the um, Mr. Mills might, I mean, if, if I understood, it was his memo that said that the additional mitigation was required, that somehow the level of service was not satisfied. Someone else. That's correct. So, so if the level of service was an F, correct, at Millstone, and that's why they were mitigating? Correct. So basically, for 285000 you're buying off the county to put in this store rather than saying we can't support it. Is that what I'm hearing? No, that, that isn't correct, Mr. Edmonds. This is this is Chris Longmore. The, the ordinance has a specific provision when you are developing within a development district that you are allowed to offer mitigation and fees in lieu to allow development to continue to occur in the development district. Otherwise, Lexington Park would be shut down in most areas. Um, that is why the ordinance kind of has that safety valve um, included in it. It's under section 70.72D is the provision, I believe. Um, so our, our, our county commissioners in adopting the, the zoning ordinance have made that policy decision that when you have a project like this that is in the area where they want development, they don't want um, that to shut down all possible development anywhere to the left or right of this intersection. Um, so they allow developers at their cost, or require developers at their cost rather, to both offer traffic improvements where appropriate or to, to pay fees in lieu to contribute to the construction of other improvements that'll help traffic in the area. Uh, I believe Mr. Mills can, can clarify this. FDR was the project in this case because certainly the hope and design of that is to pull some traffic off of Route 235, so it made sense to contribute to that. Um, and, and certainly that project is fully funded, and I by no means am an county budget expert, but I know that sometimes even fully funded projects end up being more expensive than what they're funding at. So this can certainly assist with any cost uh, overrides that, that come in as well. Yeah, you have several government employees here. We understand. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Lummer, yes, sir, mitigation no is required. Yes, for, for this intersection, it, it is. And Mr. Richardson, your point is, you know, if we did studies today based on the current traffic, mitigation may not be required. We, we don't know that. But my client is willing, again, to, to act as if traffic will be fully restored to Route 235 and do the mitigation that would be required based on those 2019 numbers um we believe it's a show of good faith you know as a developer as someone wanting to be in this county to improve it so that the citizens you know can know that if traffic comes back to where it is we're doing the mitigation that the county would have required when traffic was at full speed thank you You want to go to the next slide, Jeff? All righty. Um, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit now about um, the building elevations and how we're uh, meeting the county code relative to uh, enhanced architecture and having uh, attractive looking buildings and facades. Uh, in front of you here, you have the uh, four elevations of the building, and you'll see that it is not just a, a rectangular box. Um, the facade is broken up into several different planes. We have parapets that are extending up above the roof line to give some interest to the architecture with large copings of uh, different coordinating colors. Uh, in the front is a uh, canopy over the uh, front glass of the store, uh, providing some protection for people as they're walking in. Uh, you'll see that we have brick on the two ends and in the center portion. Uh, in the middle, we've got a um, sort of like a uh, stucco type material on the surface on the top, and then a lower band of uh, stone material uh, towards the bottom. So we're using multiple uh, different types of uh, um, 
facade treatments on there to give some interest to it. The front windows are uh, fully uh, glass and operational and see-through uh, with the front doors. You'll see on the two side facades that um, it, although they're uh, because of the interior layout with uh, coolers and shelving and uh, the different uh, layouts inside, uh, we don't necessarily have the ability to have glass that we see in, but there are glass panels uh, that will um, emulate windows so that we have an attractive facade from all sides. There's additional canopies on the sides. Uh, your side elevations uh, also break up the, um, the, the side with the burying corner uh, parapets and uh, brick banding in the center. Um, and then the rear facade also has uh, some decorations. This really won't be that visible because it backs up to the uh, building behind it, but they have still did, done the same treatment on all sides of the building so that it's a consistent look the whole way around. And here is what the building will look like with the uh, signage. You'll see that uh, 7-Eleven has its uh, normal logo, but uh, then they've got some colored bands on the front. Uh, Laredo Taco and Roost Chicken have a uh, identifier there on either side as well. And there's the back of the building, uh, which will have some signage. And this is uh, an architectural elevation of the canopy. This is not just a flat canopy, but rather as a sloped uh, standing speed metal roof on it. And uh, to the right side of the page, you'll see the dumpster enclosure. It has brick and uh, the stucco to match the building of the same color. The, uh, the poles and the coping along the top of the walls uh, and the uh, solid metal uh, enclosures for the uh, dumpsters there, the doors, uh, have the same colored metal as the roof of the building and all the trim on the main building. Uh, you'll see that uh, in the bottom view of the fuel canopy there that they're using stone to match the front of the building to come about halfway up on the pillars uh, by the pumps. And then uh, this is the signage that would be on the canopy. Uh, it will be branded as an Exxon and have their typical uh, red sign with their red stripe. And this is the car wash. The car wash has the same exact architectural style as the main building. So it has the same brick and stone and stucco. It has uh, windows um, and it has glass doors on either end with the same metal coping. And it has also, I forgot to mention on the main building, but uh, all of the uh, buildings have uh, wall wash lights. So you'll see these uh, small brown uh, rectangles here. And that is lighting uh, the face of the building up on all sides. <clears throat> and this would be the signage branding on here. So you've got uh, identifying the car wash and the entrance and exit. And so that's our, our building. Mike? Yep, so that brings us to um, our concept plan findings um, and the criteria that we've talked a little bit about already. Uh, we do believe that this project is consistent with the comprehensive Excuse plan. me, sir. Excuse uh, me. Um, yes. Mr. Medinsky, board member, um, says you never answered his seating question. Mr. Harmon. Yep, I, I have it. I have it. I was going to kind of work it in here, but I can do it right now. Um, no, that, um, that I that have wasn't. it. Oh, I'm sorry. Green. Jeff, I, I, know if you can. I did not read his mind correctly. I, I apologize. I, I was, uh, <laughs> since you were talking about the fueling stations, uh, we've talked about this before at the 7-Elevens, but the electric refueling, was that considered or? There's, is there a station for that? What was that? Electric? Is that what? Yes. You, I think yes. I heard. Uh, no, we don't have any electric. We do not propose, uh, no, no charging stations. Okay. Um, I can show, if you want, we can show. Jeff, can you pull up the seating? Do you have that in front of you? Uh, let me try here. Hold on. <laughs> I think Jeff, Bill just sent it out so you can pull it up. Okay. I mean, essentially, there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven kind of high top tables with two seats at them. And then there's like a little bar seating area, like a little window kind of where you'd have some bar stools and a ledge. Maybe Jeff can, Jeff can pull that up and make the technology work. And uh... I'm going to do my best here. <laughs> Let's see. Is everyone seeing the? Uh... Yes. 
you just zoom in on that front portion. So it's just a small area that's it's got some high top seats if somebody wanted to grab a bite at the counter and eat it before they left or take it with them. Yeah, it looks like here there's, uh, so as you enter the main front doors here towards the bottom of the page, your typical uh, checkout counter is on the left side, but to the right side coming in, you'll see a small bar against the front window with uh, looks like five stools there. And then there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tables with uh, two seats at each table. So there's seating for uh, 14 at the tables and five people at the counter. Thank you. All right. Can you bring the? Well, before we pull this off, is it, does anybody have questions about that? Because we got to get rid of this, and then we got to bring the PowerPoint back. That's Hearing none. No. I'm good. Good. I'm good. Okay. That's that's fine. I have an idea how many. It's just hard. I, I really Mr. do. It's just hard to hear. I, I, I'm struggling to hear. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Just for the record, I don't believe that slide is on board docs uh, since. Uh, it was not part of our primary presentation. We can certainly send a copy of that so a hard copy can be added to the record. Thank I know you. that it'll be shown on the video of the hearing, but we'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Okay. So going back to our findings, uh, we do believe that we're consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, the land uh, use is a medium use, medium intensity, and the zoning is MXM. Uh, the parcel is located within the Lexington Park Development District where we want development. Uh, the, concept, the comprehensive plan does designate this property to be medium intensity mixed use, and 7-Eleven with fuel sales and car wash is low intensity mixed use compatible with the zoning as Jeff had indicated in earlier slides. And per schedule 50.4 of the use classifications, use types, and location within the zoning districts of convenience store, car wash, and fuel sales are permitted low intensity uses. So we do believe we meet that criteria uh, in terms of consistency with the comprehensive plan. Um, we've already talked about some of these, but as it relates to the adequate public facilities in section 70.2.2, uh, we do believe that we can demonstrate that we can meet that. Uh, we do have adequate water and sewer available to the site. We have approval of construction documents uh, has been provided by METCOM, uh, so they've actually already approved it. Uh, we do believe that adequate roads are achievable. Um, we, we do understand that mitigation is required, um, but in accordance with county code, as Mr. Longmore has already mentioned, uh, the development is located within a designated revitalization area and or development district where the county wants to encourage new development or redevelopment. Uh, these developments would be allowed to proceed in certain areas experiencing unacceptable levels of service provided that transportation improvements are made, which result in an improvement in traffic operations beyond that, which would have been expected if the development had not occurred. So we're also, in addition to the fee and lieu mitigation, which is uh, under that section of the code, uh, we are making, in addition to that, an operational improvement by extending the turn lanes uh, that we had shown earlier. Um, we did do a traffic study, as has been mentioned, although we believe not required by the code, we did do one, um, and we're making an improvement as a result of that. SHA has reviewed that, uh, is in agreement with that. Um, Department of Public Works has approved the traffic study. Go back, Jeff. Um, the Department of Public Works has approved the traffic study and the APF application uh, with, the, with the proffer uh, that was noted there. Uh, going to FDR. Um, next slide. Sorry about that. Uh, we do believe this project will promote the health, safety, and welfare of the general public, um, providing convenient use, uh, which serves the local community, providing access to goods that don't require travel to more distant lo locations. Uh, we are providing roadway improvements that are going to enhance the operation of the intersection uh, with the extension of the turn lanes. Uh, we are going to provide jobs for the community. Uh, we are going to provide tax revenue for the greater good of the community. Uh, we are reducing the amount of impervious area on the project, uh, but maintaining the stormwater system uh, that was there for a greater uh, amount of pavement and buildings. Uh, so that's going to have a benefit in terms of runoff. Um, and we're redeveloping an existing vacant parcel. Um, so right now the, the Golden Corral has closed. Um, it's currently not in operation. It's a vacant building, um, and we think that right, revitalization and redevelopment of that so that we don't have a vacant building sitting there for an extended period of time is a benefit to the health and safety of the community. 
Uh, we do have adequately developed recreational and other community amenities uh, in accordance with the comp plan by providing 44% open space, which far exceeds the minimum requirement of 20%. And we believe we do, uh, we are consistent with chapter 62 design objectives uh, regarding the architecture as demonstrated and, and discussed by Jeff with the building facade that has desirable aspects of architecture, including brick, varied elevation heights, canopies over windows and pleasing color palettes, uh, windows on the front facade matching the color of the cornice and awnings, some faux windows are placed on all sides of the building to provide symmetry and interest to the facade. So in summary, um, the proposed use is permitted by your code. We meet all applicable code sections. Uh, we have not required or requested or needed any variances or waivers uh, for this project. Uh, we are not proposing new access points uh, to the site. These are existing entrances that have survived both uh, a McDonald's, a Golden Corral that we are proposing to reutilize. Uh, we think we've made some improvements in circulation of those access points um, by correcting what we think uh, with the parking out on Millstone close to that entrance. We, we think that this is a better flow. We did receive all uh, agent, we did receive from all agencies uh, letters of no objection to our concept plan approval. You can see those there, soil conservation, public works, planning, SHA, METCOM, and the health department. And actually, uh, since the original uh, planning and zoning hearing, we have received a final conditional approval from SHA, uh, essentially meaning that the full engineering is nearly approved. Um, we've also received the final approval from METCOM on the water and sewer. Um, and we have received final approval from the health department. Uh, we do believe the project meets all requirements for compliance with section 60.6.4 of the St. Mary's County Zoning Ordinance. Um, and we believe this project will provide road improvements to the road network to improve traffic operation, uh, as well as the contribution to the county for the future FDR project, uh, which will help the entire network in the area. And I believe with that, I think that ends our presentation. And um, I don't know, Chris, if you had any closing remarks or if you're just waiting until after public comment. Well, before Mr. Longmore gets on, I have a question of your team there. In one of my mm -hmm. packages, I was trying to find it, but it doesn't seem to appear in your presentation here. There was a slide that reflected signage. And I just had a question because if you had these two restaurants, it seemed to me that you would probably put subindentured signs on the on the street sign. And I just didn't see it reflected in your signage. And having sat on this board for close to nine years, I remember one case where signs became a major issue. So it's sort of like if you're going to if you're going to get it approved, make sure you get it the first time through, not a second time. Fair point. Uh, you're talking, and, and just so I understand, that you're talking about the sign, a pylon sign. Like well, well, the signs that can be, you, you had it reflected what was going to be on the store, what was going to be on the glass, and then also what's where the street, shall we say, the street advertisement signs. So, did yeah, we, does one of you have it hidden in your archive package? Because I know I've looked at it a dozen times. Jeff, do you want to comment on that? I'm looking for it right now. I'm sure it's in, in one of these here. It was, it was at the time, one of the last slides in the package. Yeah, I'm, I've got a, it's, it was on board docs, I think, for the full signage package. I just didn't include every single sign. Uh, let me try and share my screen again here for everybody. Yeah, and uh, I can show you the the sign that's in the package. It was included in the staff report. It's one of the staff attachments. The staff report. Yeah. Would you like Stacy to open it? Or? Okay. I mean, I it's the chairman just had it here, but I looked at what they had as exterior building signs, and I didn't see where. And what was the building signs and the pro? And as you come down through it, it's it's like. It's, I just don't want you to get caught with if you want to go up later with your your the chicken or the other place that you uh, if you want to do it try to put it in the, the initial package. 
Because it seems to be missing, or maybe I'm misreading it. No, I, I believe uh, Je uh, Bill might be able to comment on this, but this is the sign package for this store. So I, I think this is what the sign package is going to be. Okay, so you won't ha you won't be sub advertising on your basic street sign to the restaurants side of it. Bill, do you want to make make is that accurate, Bill Owen? I believe that's the case. Do you want to swear me in, or do you just want the answer? <laughs> let, let, let's swear you in. If you'd please stand and raise your right hand. Do you declare and affirm that under the penalties of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Um, so the package that you show there was a earlier iteration. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to share here. We're going to give it a try. <laughs> That show up? Yes. There you go. Okay. Can everyone see that screen? Can everyone see that or not? I can see it. Yes. So there will be there will be uh, signage for the restaurants on the main sign. Um, you can see where uh, our signage consultant, 7-Eleven signage consultants already worked through and done the analysis as to square footage and so forth. And the signage here, as you can see, this will be the one that's over on uh, over on uh, Millstone Landing. You can see both of these are are compliant um, as to the as to the ordinance requirement. That answer the question. It's, so you've got it included in the package or the or your specs. Okay. Because it looked like it was omitted before. It, it was not in the original. Okay. Um, would you want them to submit that to be an exhibit? Why not? Yes. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I, I mean, we certainly can. The, the, the signage is not, you know, one of the required elements of the, of the concept site plan, but we're happy to provide it. That's that's the current uh, design of it, so we'll be happy to provide another exhibit to add to the record. That would be great. No, I just, Mr. Longmore, I just remember about many years back, two buildings that sat vacant for over a year because signs weren't allowed to be put on them as an, because they, short shifted themselves when they developed it. So I just want to always pay attention to that, that okay? So I do. Yeah, yeah. certainly. No, I, remember, I was involved in that case, I believe, and I remember the board working with that applicant. I appreciate that. Mr. Longmore, are, where, where are we at? Are you finished your presentation? Uh, th that was our presentation. We're certainly available for any other questions. Um, I would, again, like the opportunity to brief closing argument, but I'm happy to defer to that until after public comment, um, unless the board has any questions comment. for us at this I time. I think what we'll do before we start the public hearing process, we'll go through and uh, we'll take a 15-minute break. And I think we have one more com uh, question before that. Uh, one more question before that. Uh, this was by... This presentation was Becker Morgan Group. Is that, how is that affiliated with 7-Eleven? Are they a subcontractor or, or is it a part of the organization? How does it, how does it tie in organizationally? Were you just contracted sure, to is, do this, this or what? All right, so this is William Owen from Pentex Ventures. We're the owner of the current Golden Corral site. Uh, we're a developer, real estate developer for 7-Eleven, and we operate what's known as a built-to-suit program, where in essence, we buy the real estate, secure approvals, and construct the improvements. Uh, it's a turnkey uh, scenario where we hand the keys over to 7-Eleven, they move in the ho-hos and uh, pour the Slurpee in the machines and start collecting money for, uh, you know, for, you know, the various things that they sell. Um, we have retained Betty Tustin uh, from the traffic group and Mike Ryman and Jeff from Becker Morgan Group and also Christopher Longmore uh, to represent Pentex Ventures uh, in our endeavors to secure approvals for our tenant with whom we have an executed lease, 7-Eleven. Okay. Okay, if we could take, uh, let's say, a 10-minute break, so we'll start at 10 of 9.
the board will now open the hearing up for public testimony. To repeat, as I said earlier, if you want to phone in and make a comment, please call 301-475-4200, extension 1234. Thank you. Stacy. I can call Sherry. Give me a second. Board of Appeals. Uh, Sherry, do we have any calls? Uh, they're coming through, and I, it's been like okay. about 15, so all right. Okay, on, thank you. On. All right. Got <laughs> Uh, she's got to um, take their information and um, put them on hold for us. Oh, no. Give her a moment. <laughs> this, this is where you learn. If you go to the big list, this is where you learn the oath. <laughs> yes. Especially if it's a room full of people. Okay, we've got a flashing light. Mm. Oh, I should just be able to pick it up. When I hit the, hit, the, hit the flash and light and then mm -hmm. the connect. First connect. It, it'll pop up when you hit oh, the flash yeah. and light. Oh, yeah. Okay. This is the Board of Appeals. May I have your name and address? Oh, no. She told me My that. name is Catherine Rayleigh. My address is 46399 East Hill Road, Lexington Park, Maryland. Two zero six five three. Okay, thank you, Kathleen. Um, Kathleen Rarely. Catherine Rarely. Catherine Rarely. Yes. Um, if you would please uh, take the oath uh, before we start your testimony. Do you declare and affirm, under the penalty of perjury, that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. You may proceed. You may proceed, ma'am. Um, great, thank you. Um, I am calling in as a resident of Esperanza Farm. I've grown up in this neighborhood. This is the neighborhood directly off Millstone Landing Road. After hearing all this information today, it seems very clear that this, a lot of these people have never made a left-hand turn out of Millstone Landing Road onto 235. This intersection is very busy. There's a lot of traffic regardless of COVID. It is not a safe intersection. To add a gas station that will, as it's been noted, will increase traffic is not, a, it's unsafe. It's unsafe for me. It's unsafe for the other families that drive this road every day. It's unsafe for Green Holly Elementary School, which is less than a quarter of a mile away from 7-Eleven. Green Holly Elementary School has a lot of students. With schools reopening, it will have a lot of bus traffic. And I'm concerned about the safety of our students, our bus drivers, our families that drive this road every day. Further, the, um, Mr. Reinman had talked about the health, safety, and welfare of changing Golden Kraut into a 7-Eleven. I don't see how that will increase the health, safety, and welfare of my neighborhood. Um, revitalization of Lexington Park. Esperanza Farms is across the street from the California, Maryland Post Office. If we need to revitalize Lexington Park, I think that our um, project should be more focused on Great Mills Road, Shangri-La Drive, and St. Mary's Square. Um, I also don't see how this is an asset to the community when it does increase safety and traffic concerns. And it's not adding any convenience if the traffic is so backed up that we're not able to access it. We are able within just a couple of miles to have gas stations elsewhere. So I don't wanna risk my safety for something that will not be convenient. People cut through that parking lot constantly to get around 235 and avoid the light. There's backup from the PNC Bank on the other side of that intersection. Um, there's backup from San Susi Plaza. You can see it in the turn lanes, people speeding through, running red lights, and going through the current empty parking lot to cut traffic. Um, so just, again, as a resident who has 
grown up here, who has a home here, I object to the 7-Eleven being put in. Thank you. Okay, well, we we'll hold on a second, Ms. Raley. Uh, does the board members have any questions? No, sir. No, sir. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. The attorney, Chris? Uh, no. No. Ah, no. Not now. You can speak out. Okay. Let's see. This is the Board of Appeals. May I have your name, please? Yes, Patrick Hunt. Patrick Hunt. That's correct. Patrick Hunt. Okay, hold for just a moment. We're okay, Mr. I Mr. Otz, if you if you would take the oath for me, please. Do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, thank you very much. Proceed. Uh, I've been a resident down here in Esperanza Farms for close to 20 years now. Um, I originally worked in D.C. and came down to, came to come home in the evening and had to deal with the rush hour traffic coming out of the base. Sit and could sit through two cycles before you can make a left-hand turn onto Millstone Landing Road. You would have the traffic coming from the base blocking the intersection. Then you would have the traffic coming out of San Sushi Plaza blocking the intersection. Now, it's been said that we don't know if the base is going to go back to 100%. If it even comes back to 50%, we will still have that problem of attempting to make a left-hand turn onto, the, onto Millstone Landing Road. It seems to be the entire conversation this evening has been about 235 and not about Millstone Landing Road. There are, there are several hundred people who live off of Millstone Landing Road. There is an elementary school about a thousand feet from the intersection of 235 and Millstone Landing Road. You have traffic backed up, not just in rush hour, but during the day, where those buses have to wait to be able to cross over 235. You now have McKay's, brand new McKay's built into San Sushi, which has increased the traffic coming out of there. You have the, uh, the car dealership, the Ford dealership, and I believe there's a, another dealership, Weingartner, is going to be opening up soon, dumping more traffic onto 235, and any of those people who wish to go north will have to make the turn at Millstone Landing Road. You have instance after instance, every one of us that live down here know that we make, when we make that left-hand turn onto Millstone Landing, we have to be very conscious of the cars in front of us. Invariably, you have a car in the right left-hand lane immediately stop to turn into the shopping center that's right there now. Or when the Golden Corral was open, the same thing. You have often have to swerve to avoid that car and go into the other left-hand lane. Or you're in that the lane and the car is in the far left-hand lane, immediately turn into the shopping center where the PNC Bank is. And as the young lady before me said, Invariably, you have people coming north on 235, cutting through that parking lot where the 7-Eleven will be, cutting through the parking lot of the current store, or turning onto Millstone Landing, making an immediate left into the parking lot so they can avoid the traffic back up at that intersection. We don't know what the base is going to do. We sure as the devil should be planning that it will come back in some capacity and is going to affect that intersection. The 7-Eleven, 7-Eleven is a recipe for, the, not, and I should, let me take this back. It's not the 7-Eleven. Any business of this size is a recipe for disaster at that intersection. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. If you hold on a second, do the board members have any questions? No, sir. Mr. Longmore? No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hudson. Next caller. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Board of Appeals. Can I have your name, please? Sure, Susan Smith. Susan Smith. Susan Smith. 
Yeah. Um, this is Dan Ekniowski, and I would like to take you to take. I would like to have you take the oath. Do you declare and affirm under the penalty and per of perjury? Uh, hi, I am also a resident of Esperanza Farms. Okay, hold, 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 hold. ma'am, ma'am, hold on. You need to take the oath um, okay. to be sworn into the hearing, please. Okay. Do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Do you uh, uh, confirm affirmative to the oath, ma'am? Yes, I'm just having trouble hearing. Okay, okay. Well, you may proceed. You may proceed, ma'am. Thank you. I am also a resident of Esperanza Farms, and Kathy spoke about making the left onto 235 South. Patrick talked about making the left onto Millstone, Millstone Landing. In addition to that, there's an issue with making that right-hand turn onto Millstone Landing from 235. There's not enough room to merge to get back into the neighborhood with additional traffic coming in and out of those PNC, um, the Days Off Deli parking lot, as well as the Golden Corral parking lot, I've had at least one near miss every month since I've lived there. I didn't hear in this proposal any consideration given to any of the residents of the Esperanza Farms neighborhood. I heard no impact on the traffic on Millstone Landing. The discussions were all about pass-through traffic. Pass-through traffic isn't really pass-through if it goes into the 7-Eleven and comes back out onto Millstone Landing Road. In addition, you know, everybody talks about the Ford dealership. That doesn't back up right onto a neighborhood. There's no been no consideration for the residents. Um, my final statement is the fee in lieu of the additional traffic doesn't help us in our neighborhood unless it's applied to and make improvements on Millstone Landing and, and to work to improve that intersection above and beyond adding four more spots in that left-hand turn lane onto Millstone Landing. And I, finally, I don't think anybody's given consideration to how many accidents have actually been recorded at this intersection. That's all I have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Smith. If you'd hold on for a second, do the board members have any questions? No, sir. No. Mr. Longmore? No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Thanks. This is the Board of Appeals. May I have your name? Hi, my name is Bill Reimer. Mr. Reimer, could you hold on for the oath? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Mr. Hi, Mr. Reimer. This is Dan Ekniowski, and I'd like to uh, give you the oath, have you to take the oath. Do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Mr. Reimer? Are you going to affirm the oath, sir? Yes. Okay, thank you. But you may proceed. Mr. Reimer? You may proceed, sir. Mr. Reimer, could you hold on for the oath? Absolutely. You can turn the TV down, sir. It might be easier to hear through the phone. Perjury, <laughs> the testimony, responses, and statements you may give the whole truth. Mr. Reimer? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, you may proceed, sir. Probably is. Hello? Yes. Yes, you may proceed. All right. Your statement. Uh, I'm a retired engineer. I live here in Esperanza Farms. I've lived here since 1971. I've seen every possible phase of 
disaster at this intersection up here with 235. Um, there has to be a better, safer use for that property. Uh, traffic will boom at that intersection no matter what it is now it will boom and I think we ought to face reality with 7-elevens statistically around here and in many places in the area 7-elevens are thug magnets we have nasty crime across 235 right now from our area. Uh, the vaping facilities, the liquor store, the last thing in the world we need for safety and benefit of our population is a 7-Eleven thug magnet. <coughs> Traffic-wise, the place is already rated F by the state. It's a failed intersection. The last thing we need is 16 additional gas pumps at our street entrance. And I really got to look at, I was impressed with one of the solid rules of planning for our area. In order to be approved, it must promote health, safety, and welfare of the citizens. There is no way in God's green earth this promotes health, safety, and welfare of us. And I repeat, there has to be a better, safer use for that property. Thank you. Mr. Reimer, if you hold on for a second. Hold on do, for just a moment, Do sir. the board members have any questions? No, sir. Mr. Longmore? No questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Mr. Reimer. Thank you, Mr. Reimer. You have a nice evening. Thank you. This is the Board of Appeals. Can I have your name, please? It's Todd Morgan. Mr. Morgan, can you hold on for the oath? Yeah, fine. Okay. Mr. Morgan, do you declare and affirm under the penalties of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Do you confirm affirmative to the oath, sir? I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Okay, my name is Todd Morgan. I live at 46536 Millstone Landing Road, and I'm calling in opposition to the 7-Eleven. I have listened for the last two hours to very passionate um, pleas by the developer of to what's going to go on, but quite frankly, when you consider health, safety, and welfare to the situation, it's not there. As was pointed out previously, the intersection is an F. An F is an F, and an F fails. When you consider the consideration of the proper, you are mixing apples and oranges. The Ford dealership proper had nothing to do with what the 7-Eleven is doing. It had to do with the access, it had to do with the turnaround circle, and the ability to expand FDR Boulevard down from Chances Run to Peg Road. When we want to discuss such situations as the Golden Corral and the, and the former McDonald's, that's correct. But those were not in and out. You went in, you sat down, you ate. Um, we discussed the base openings. The base openings we do not know about. I agree. The newest number is July, but who knows what's going to happen there. When we consider the uh, um, remediation, yes, a, a Tier 2 requirements are going to be able to be met by the 7-Eleven because you are on the east side of 235. It don't have to do with the mitigation that DNR is going to put on. But at the big thing, the big thing, folks, here is, this black, is the box, is that there is no police enforcement whatsoever of 235. If anyone listened to the sheriff on Tuesday in a meeting with the commissioners, he said, we don't have time for this. We have one safety officer. It just so happens that from 2 to 5 in the afternoon, that is when everyone happens to be on call. And anyone who sits at that intersection knows that they block the box. Whether it be people traveling north and don't want to wait for the red light, 
they block the box. When the light turns at the intersection for San Sushi to come out, they block the box. The people trying to make a left-hand turn can't get out. The people to come south to, onto Millstone Lane Road, people trying to make a left-hand turn south on 235 can't get out. This is a health and safety matter. We can go through every code St. Mary's County has, and you can dance around everything, and it can look really good. And everything that you want to construct there meets code. I can't deny that. But the health and safety of my community, where I live and I represent, is in peril with the 7-Eleven. And I encourage you to vote no. And by the way, this is no different than the discussion you had a number of months ago about the 7-Eleven at Leonardtown Middle School. Same thing, except here you got a lot more traffic, folks. And you know as well as I do. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. If you hold on for a second, do the board members have any questions? No, sir. Mr. Longmore, do you have any questions? I might have one. Uh, no, I don't have any com uh, questions I, I for Mr. Morgan. Back. We Thank have you. one question from a board member. Yeah, here I am shooting my mouth off again. Mr. Morgan, this is John Brown. Uh, are you still a member of the Navy Forum or the whatever that group was that interfaced between the county and the, uh, and the Navy? I think you used to be a member of it. Did he hear it? Uh, I don't think the, they can hear you. Yes, ma'am. Did, could you hear Mr. Brown's question to you? I did not. Okay. He asked if you were still a member of the forum that interacts between the county and the Navy. Navy Alliance. Navy Alliance. Yes. Navy Alliance. Interacts between the. I am. I am a. I am a representative to the Navy Alliance. Yes. Have you, then the question is, what do do you know? Is any for sort of input in terms of plans to retract or shall we say base shall we say hot bunking the ba the base is, I mean your desk rather than uh, coming to work every day in other words off-site in-home work I hear you correctly Mr. Brown the base has been very vague as to what's going to happen when they come back the newest anticipated comeback date is going to be in July Webster Field, they're talking about maybe possibly April. Um, that's all still up in the air, and I don't have a crystal ball whatsoever to tell you what's going to happen, but I do know that there is tremendous, tremendous angst in the community for people who want to go back to work. There's a desire. There, the pent-up frustration that exists between the government workers, the contractors, and us on base is, is, is really bad right now. They want to go back to work, and when that happens, I believe that they will be coming back on 235. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Thank you. Oh, by the way, Mr. Brown, Virginia Tech is down by four. <laughs> what was that wisecrack? I said Virginia Tech's down by four. <laughs> but Maryland won today, didn't they? Both of them, men and women. Actually, I, what, what, what do you say about the score? I appreciate that. Instead, they're Sorry. down by four. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye. <laughs> Bye -bye. Oh, they'll pull it out just like UVA did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my five. This is Board of Appeals. Can yeah. I have your name, please? John Harris. John Harris. Mm -hmm. Okay, John Harris. Um, if you please take the oath for me. Do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Did you hear the oath, sir? Did you confirm the oath, sir? Yes, I'm listening. Okay, I will repeat it. Yes. Okay, he heard you. Yes. Thank you. You may proceed. Yes, I did. You may proceed, sir. Okay. Yes, I did. Okay. You may proceed, huh? Okay. Thank you. My name is John Harris. I also am a resident of Esperanza Farms. My name is John Harris. I am also a resident of Esperanza Farms. Can I go? Mr. Harris, if you could turn mm -hmm. your TV down while you give your statement, it might be easier for you to hear us okay. in the conference room. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir, we can hear you. 
Okay. So my name is John Harris. I'm a resident of Esperanza Farms. Sweet. Been here for about 20 years. Uh, I sent in my comments earlier in the week. You have them. And I was going to address two areas, traffic and crime. Traffic, I think, has been fairly well discussed. Crime, I wanted to, to discuss. Uh, in my input, in my comments, I identified seven different cases of crime at 7-Elevens around the uh, geographic area of us, some of them over in Virginia, some up in, in the uh, uh, greater Washington area. It, it seems that 7-Eleven attracts crime, and we're a residential community, and we've already had some break-ins. Uh, you've also got Green Holly School, which is a would be a target of vandalism as well as the community and also uh you're asking people to uh you're, you're suggesting that people aren't going to come uh through the community uh speeding through the community and we have small children it's dangerous so i i just think that uh, we're looking at a potential for uh, uh increases in vandalism or robbery and uh, even crime at the 7-eleven That's, that is my comment. Okay, if you hold on for a second, do Did the board members this? have any questions? Yes. Uh, Mr. Longmore, do you have any questions? N no, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Harris, very much. Thank you, Mr. Harris, you have a nice evening. You too, bye. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. in... This is the Board of Appeals. Could you please state your name? Mary Lover. Mary Lover? Yes, that's correct. Okay, Mary Lover. Okay, Mary. The well, oath? I will, I will give you the oath now. Do you declare and affirm under the penalties of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Do you confirm? I do. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. You may proceed. I am in favor of this. Uh, my children are involved in sports in the county, and it is very difficult to get in and out of the couple convenience stores that are available in that area. And the lack of gas stations in the area, I believe this is a, is a good growth project for the community. Thank you, ma'am. If you'd hold on, is that is that all? Is that your state? Okay, hang hang on. Um, do the board members have any questions? No, sir. Um, Mr. Longmore, do you have any questions? No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Walther. Thank you, Ms. Long. <laughs> okay. This is Board of Appeals. Could you please state your name? My name is Gail Gibson. Ms. Gibson, Gail Gibson. Okay. Yes. Uh, Ms. Gibson, um, if you will listen to the oath, please, and, and affirm or whatever. Do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, you may proceed. You may proceed, Ms. Gibson. Hi, I'm calling in um, opposition or opposing the 7-Eleven ban at the corner of 235 and Millstone Landing. I am a resident of Esperanza Farms. I have lived here for 30 years. I raised my children here and my parents moved into the neighborhood as elderly, trying to get those kids to school when they were driving through the intersection was a nightmare and Hail Marys were said every day. The same with my father as a senior citizen driving in and out. That quarter, corner intersection has been a nightmare. We do not need a 7-Eleven with more gas pumps that are gonna be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's gonna increase traffic that's already to 
we have gas if you get to the intersection and you go a half a mile to the left there's or south on 235 there are walla with the 24 7 where you can convenience store you can get your gas if you get to the intersection of 235 and millstone and go a half a mile north the sheets is right there with the convenience of running in to get something 24 7 to get your sandwiches or to get your gas it is not necessary to increase our public danger for lack of a better word it does not help our public safety at all when you were referring to the golden corral and mcdonald's they were not open 24 7. so we didn't have the increased traffic We've already had issues at the Wawa with muggings and shootings, and we don't need, and it's occurring in the evenings and whatnot. We don't need that at the 7-Eleven, this close to our neighbors, and it's a family environment. It's a community where we live and are raising our kids and whatnot. We have the elementary school, as many of the callers that have called in have mentioned numerous buses going in and out we have pnc bank and i'll tell you the pnc bank when the lexington park bank closed has increased traffic i drive to work i go to work in my office now even during covid and i sit at the traffic light and there's i'm probably like the fourth or fifth car back because i cannot get through where people are coming out of um, pnc there's either buses sitting there or i have to sit there so it takes me two lights sometimes to get through and even then, you're going through that intersection, again, saying your Hail Marys. There have been numerous accidents and fatalities there. We have lost neighbors and friends at that intersection. So I just want to go on the record that I am not for this, and I hope it doesn't happen. And Ms. Dix <coughs> Excuse me. Ms. Dixon, if you'd hold on for a second. Are there any questions from the board members? No, no sir. No. Mr. Longmore, do you have any questions? No questions, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Dixon. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's it, but I will call Sherry to make sure. Board of Appeals. Sherry, do we have any more callers? Uh, at this at this time, we do not have any further callers, even though there was interest. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, no no additional questions um, or public comment. Uh, what I'd like to do now, I guess, is turn it back over to Mr. Longmore for summation. And then I will also certainly thank you. Close Mr. the public Chairman. hearing first. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Mr. Longmore. I'm sorry. All right. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the board, for for your attention and consideration tonight of this application. Um, first, in in response to some of the public comments, just to. To, to share a few thoughts with the board, then I'll get into kind of our general summary. Um, one thing that I feel I'd be remiss not putting on the record is the attorney for the applicant. Um, and, and I know the board is aware of this. I know certainly your attorney, the county attorney is aware of this, that um, an individual project um, cannot be required to mitigate or solve a problem that it did not cause. Um, it can be required to mitigate any additional traffic that would be added to this location. But it, it is not the duty or, or burden of this applicant um, to solve other issues that existed before um, this application came before you. That that would be a, um, an illegal taking if they were required to do it, and, and that simply is not allowed under our legal system. Um, you know, I, we certainly understand that um, there are neighbors in the neighborhood that have concerns about this that have uh, fears that they've expressed. Um, but, you know, what, what I will say is this, is that it's difficult, and, and I do a lot of this work, as the board knows. Um, we often have, you know, neighbors that come out and do not 
um, want something somewhere. Um, they have every right to voice their concerns and opinions, and, and I, I respect and um, certainly uh, don't uh, belittle them or, or in any way say that they shouldn't have the right to do that. Um, but, but what we have, the, the system we have is that we have a group of rules, um, and the speakers that spoke before you um, certainly know that. Um, they're rules that are passed by our county commissioners and adopted by our county commissioners that every applicant that comes before the planning commissioner of this board has to meet. And when you look at our application, I'm, uh, I'm grateful um, to, to my clients and, and to the folks I've presented before. Um, I'm sure the board is. I don't need to go over the five standards because I think those were covered in detail before. Um, but, but what I can say is that when you have a set of rules like we have that are complicated and difficult to meet, um, they have to be applied fairly. And I do take some exception to one of the comments that Lexington Park Ford was a completely different project. It was one that was approved very recently. And as I believe this board knows, and, and it's in the traffic reports and in the, and in the ordinances themselves, that when you develop a property, you have to look at the intersections, the, most, the, the closest intersections to the property you're developing in order to determine traffic patterns. The Lexington Park Ford had to look at the same intersection we're here talking about tonight. Um, and, and the reason, one of the reasons they needed to do mitigation, it's in the record, was because of this intersection. And they did their mitigation just like we're proposing to do. Um, and, and it may have been for a different segment of FDR, but it's the same project. Um, so uh, one of the things that I think this board you know, should be careful about, and, and all of our boards and officials should be careful about, it's treating all applicants um, that come before the board fairly um, and in the same manner as other applicants. If the rules are strict, my clients always tell me they can live with that. But when there are rules that they follow and they're not applied um, in a consistent way, that's where we really run into, into a place where I think it's legally challenging for, for the county, but it's also just completely unfair. Now, I'd ask that you consider the site that we're, we're looking at. Certainly, there, there is a neighborhood further down Millstone Landing Road. They have to drive through this intersection. We appreciate that. But this site is in the Lexington Park Development District. That is the district that our county commissioners has designated as our primary development district. That is where they have said they want all the development to go. And, and I can't tell you how many times I've been before the Planning Commission and, and some before this board where I'll be with a project that's developing a brand new site. And the comments I get back or the challenges I get back are, we don't want somebody to build something new. We're afraid of all the vacant buildings we already have and we don't want them to sit vacant. And if this board ignores the plain language of the ordinance, ignores the standards that we have and looks at my client and says, yes, you meet the standards, but because some people spoke out against it, um, or because I don't like the brand of store that you have um, that you're proposing, um, that goes completely against the comprehensive plan and the goals that have been uh, set forth by both the Planning Commission and this board. Uh, so we'd ask that you consider this. There is a vacant restaurant there that shut down because during this COVID crisis, there are communities that are in peril and losing much economic power and engine and tax base. And we have a developer that is here that is investing in our community, that looked at our rules and is willing to follow them, that is investing an extra 300,000 plus to both improve the intersection that they're building at, even though it wasn't improved by Golden Corral or McDonald's when they were there. Um, and they're willing to contribute toward the construction of a road that will also alleviate some traffic from 235. I've heard the county commissioners at their table say that's the reason we're building that. And we all know that's the reason why it's already being used on the section that's opened up and it's, and it's been a very nice project. Um, you know, what, what I'm concerned about and what really causes an incredible chilling effect is when you have these rules that are difficult and you require applicants to go through them and they can be applied in a haphazard fashion. 
it will cause a chilling effect to our community if you do that. This is a site that was already developed. Some of the, the folks that spoke said it's not an in, it wasn't an in and out site before. It sure was when it was McDonald's. They had a drive through there. So you can't tell me that wasn't an in and out site then. And this is being redeveloped in a way that is more environmentally friendly, is better traffic pattern wise, has is improving the intersection off of two, or the uh, entrance off of 235 to get into the project. And it simply meets all the standards of our ordinance. All we ask is that you look at the five standards that you're supposed to meet and, and look at our project. We don't require any variances. I know this board is well aware of that process. We meet all the standards. We're making it more environmentally friendly. We're redeveloping a site that has been developed for decades within the Lexington Park Development District on our main road within the development district, right where we want commercial development, as can be seen by the, the zoning category that it was rezoned as by our county commissioners just a couple years ago. If they wanted to rezone this property to downtown, they could have and they did not during the Lexington Park Development District process. So all we ask here tonight is that you look at the five standards. We believe that as summarized at the end of our presentation, that we more than meet them. You have an applicant here that is willing to do their share of mitigation, even believing that traffic probably will be less regardless of what happens in July or beyond, but they're willing to mitigate as if we're at full traffic before this, this crisis that we're in. And uh, we, I was flabbergasted at the Planning Commission that a project like this could get shut down when it meets, as, as one of the, the folks that spoke said, when it meets every part of the code. So we ask that you, you look at the applica application. Um, we are proud of it. We believe that it improves this site. We believe that it will be a convenience for many citizens of our, our county. And as this board well knows, the people that are going to enjoy and use this and be happy it's there are probably not the people watching a hearing on a Thursday night on YouTube. Um, but, but I have no doubt that this will be a well-visited business. It'll be a prosperous business, and it will be one that many of our citizens, as the one that spoke in support of it, will enjoy and appreciate as a convenience store that is convenient and that our citizens can use as they're leaving the base to fill up or as they're running around like I do with my kids to all their sporting events. So we'd ask that you give us just consideration. We appreciate your attention tonight. And certainly if you have any questions of us that have not been asked or that we haven't answered, we'd be happy to do so. Thank you. Before we enter the discussion portion, do we have any comments, any questions? Yes, I have some questions. I don't know if other people have. I also have one, but I don't know if it can be answered here tonight. It's probably more of a comment. We've been hearing about this F intersection. It's failing. How many more of those do we have in the county? I don't, I don't, this, this is the first time I've heard of a failing intersection. I, don't, I just don't, I don't know. I would imagine 235 and Route 4 is an F failing intersection. I'm, I'm not sure. We had a hearing there. I don't, it was, I don't, no. I don't know if it was or not. I, uh, thought, I, thought I mean, there. I, I I know Mr. Mills is here. I don't know if he knows the statistics. I, I believe that intersection is as well that um, the, 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 the chair just mentioned. Um, and, and again, the, the F designation, it, it certainly says that in the designations. We're not trying to, to dance around that in any way. But our zoning ordinance specifically addresses those type of intersections within the development district and says that when you're in them, that you can still develop if you're near one of those intersections as long as you mitigate. And, and that's section 70.7.2D. Uh, as, as I read my zoning ordinance, and, and I'm sure Mr. Knight will correct me or Mr. Hotwell if I'm wrong, my zoning ordinance appears to say that that provision was most recently amended and updated in 2013. So, so that is not an old rule that has just sat there that nobody knew about. It's one that was put in place by, you know, fairly recently by our Board of County Commissioners. So if this were an F intersection outside of the Development District, it would be a different conversation. But our County Commissioners have made that policy 
decision that when you're in the development district and you're you're at one of these actions intersections that they don't want to shut down all new development on Route 235 because it could do that around the intersection of four and 235. It could do it at this intersection as well, and they didn't want to do that, so they said instead of doing that, as long as you don't make it worse and you mitigate what you're putting there, we're going to allow development to go within our development district. Okay. Mr. Brown. Okay, I have a couple questions. I want to make sure we get on the record. What is the hours of operation for this 7-Eleven? Is it a is it a seven twenty four seven, or is it something less than that? I mean, perhaps a uh, uh, bill or or someone else can can address that because that'll need to be in testimony. Yeah, th this will be, I believe, a 24-7 location. Okay, I just want to make sure it was there. Um, also, on the traffic studies, was it only 235, the intersection? Were any of the additional roads down Millstone that we've heard in our public comments, um, any of those addressed, like coming out of PNC or some of that stuff? Well... And I can let the engineers certainly speak to that and correct me if I'm wrong. The, the traffic studies require that you study the intersections that are, are closest to the development. And so the intersection, when we've been saying 235, I, I believe all, almost all of the comments, if not all of them, have been talking about its interaction with Millstone Landing Lane. That wasn't meant to slight um, that, that road. We certainly understand that that road is very important to the people that live on it of course, more than anybody else. Uh, but, but all of the studies were designed to, to look at that intersection. Um, are, are, are Betty or, or, or um, you know, any of you can jump in if I'm speaking anything wrong. But the design also does look at the entrances to make sure they're proper site distances and that there aren't any conflicts that would make them too dangerous to be approved by DT, DP, DPW or State Highway, respectively. But I can let you all speak to that. Just to add, just to add, this is Mike Ryman, just to add to that, and, and that generally, too, because this is a convenience use with such a high pass-by percentage, studying the intersection that the convenience store is located at is the critical intersection to look at. Uh, because, as Betty had stated in her testimony, 76% of traffic that visits these facilities are already on the roadway. Um, so if studying the effects of traffic at the immediate intersection is the key. So to answer my question, the only site that was studied was studied. Millstone and, and uh, 235. No other intersection correct. along Millstone, no. correct? That's correct. Okay, now I have a question about the traffic study, and I'm sorry I missed it when we had Ms. Tustin, because she has her big PE stamp on it. But on page three, there are two blocks, and it's under existing level of service. And I guess showing two different methodologies for calculating. One was, a, I guess, a CLV study and basically said Millstone Landing Road and MacArthur Boulevard was an F. Now you get down to another block below that and it says utilizing the HCM methodology that Maryland 235 and Millstone Landing Road were a C, 33.5. However, in the narrative when it talks about the HCM uh, approach methodology by adding in things like the Ford dealership and the proposed 7-Eleven, they come up with with a, a level E. So is what are we dealing with here and what it's rated as? Because it, it looks like you have two methodologies and you may be trying to push one over the other. Or, or the major differences and distinguishing characteristics of these two methodologies. What is that, okay? There are, um, that's a good question. There are two methodologies that we use in traffic engineering. One is the CLV method, 
which looks at the volume and the geometry of the intersection. The other is a more complicated, uh, sophisticated method called the HCM Highway Capacity Manual Methodology, which looks at the operational, the signal timing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, St. Mary's County for signalized intersection and their code asked us to look at CLV. We provided the HCM analysis because State Highway is familiar with that, and this was a response also to the State Highway Administration. But in St. Mary's County, they asked us for signalized intersection to use this CLV, the critical lane volume methodology. And they do have, in, in some cases, different results. So according to the St. Mary's and, and criteria, Mr. you're suggesting that that it really, it really is a level F at the peak hour. Using this, the critical lane methodology, yes, it, we have a level of service F, but as Mr. Longmore expressed, that is permitted in the code as long as there is some mitigation provided for it. Using the highway capacity manual methodology, which considers the signal timing, how much green somebody has, you know, you have for each approach, we have a level of service E, and we can improve that as that chart shows to a D with some adjustments in that signal timing. And Mr. Edmond, on behalf of, of my client, just to, to make it clear again, the traffic study that we're reviewing is not required legally um, under our code. Um, and, and I believe at, at the first, I was not representing these folks at their first planning commission hearing. Um, but as I understand it, staff agreed with that going into the hearing, but the planning commission asked for this study, which my client agreed to do because they wanted to allay any fears. And when the study was done um, and it suggested that mitigation should be required, they agreed to do it. But, but there is a provision within our code that when you're, when you're not adding um, too many trips to an existing road, you don't have to go through a traffic study. Um, both, you know, because of the expense and otherwise. But again, you, you know, I think I asked the board to think about that. You have an applicant that knew they were not required to do it, but they agreed to do it because it was a concern of the county. And when they did it, they agreed to mitigate all the problems that were found in that study. Um, if an applicant like that is not um, acknowledged for going above and beyond, um, again, this, this board should really consider the type of signal you're sending to to folks that buy a piece of property that haven't allowed use that's in the development district that can meet all the standards. If this type of project gets denied, I mean, you know, good gosh, this isn't something that's not in the development district or in an area that just has uh, residences around it. This is on our main strip where there's businesses on all sides of it and there's always been a business here. Any other questions? And I would, uh, I'd note for the record the the comments from DPW do confirm in the record that were before the planning commission that no traffic study was required. But again, just so th this is a record we need to establish before this board as well. Uh, legally, that was not required, even though my client uh, did so voluntarily. Thank you, Mr. Longmore. Um, I believe now it is time for the board to discuss and come up with a decision. Anybody like to start? Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd start. First, I'd say that 235 is the main artery in St. Mary's County. It's in the development district. It's zoned correctly. And if there's an expectation that you're going to drive on 235 to do business and not have traffic and be able to just pull into a parking spot, you're, you're mistaken. This is what the county wants us to do, is have it in a central area. And there's no expectation there's not going to be any traffic. And I, I, I would vote to approve it. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, my comments are essentially, as long as you have a traffic study that basically says it's, the intersection is failing, how can we sit here and put the check mark in adequate public facilities? I just can't do it. Hints have been sent by this board very loud and clear. Go find out what the base is doing, what their hours are going to be, and how many people are going to be using that. But 
you know, as long as the record shows it's a failing intersection, how can we add to it? I mean, that's what we're doing. And hey, uh, it may be zoned, but it's with this kind of traffic, uh-uh. And I seriously question. Now, if, if it, what, it turns out to be what I think it will be, meaning less traffic, and they had the numbers, that, that's supportable, maybe. But you hear too many people, and believe me, I think we've all come b back through there at ourselves <clears throat> at, at the wrong time of day. And you're lucky because of the chain of traffic lights all the way up to Route 4, uh, and not being timed, and I'm sure they attempted to try to get that worked, but it doesn't work. You're lucky to get two or three and people, cars through an intersection or out of an intersection turning left or right, and yes, and I'm one of them. I'll block the intersection in order to get through. And I, I, when I hear this out of these people, I, as representatives of them, I just can't support it, okay? Okay. Anybody want to go next? Sure, I will. First, I really want to uh, commend 7-Eleven on the site improvements. I think they, they really were impressive. However, I don't feel that the site improvements will help to contribute to the safety of that intersection. Uh, today, for example, I don't think anyone was home, and I don't know how many people on the base, but everybody was on 235 today because I was out there. There was a <coughs> lot of traffic. Um, and I think one of the things that we're focusing on, or maybe not focusing on, is the fact that you keep talking about the 7-Eleven store. I think we need, really need to think hard about how many cars are going to be coming there to refuel. I think we've kind of danced around that and sort of focused us more to the who's going to be visiting the store, not who's going to be visiting the gas tanks, not to mention the car wash. So putting all that together and looking at, we, looking at the fact that we are dealing with a failed intersection, um, it's, it's going to be a hard decision to make. I, I would be glad to go next. Um, go ahead. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. <laughs> um, I guess be, being, being part of the industry that we heard tonight, uh, being a civil engineer, being familiar with traffic studies, being familiar with, with, with uh, development projects, I think a very good, this, the, there was a very good job done by the applicant in preparing his plan. There were no other exceptions um, that we heard to the ordinance. I think with the F intersection, yes, it's there. It's at a PM peak. And uh, the rest of the intersection operates at an acceptable level. We have proposed mitigation to ease the situation, not only at this intersection, but will ultimately be up and down 235. Um, FDR Boulevard was always designed to take traffic off of 235. And I can tell you, I remember from back in the late 70s, early 80s, that the original intent was to build FDR Boulevard as a land access route. 235 at that time was to be a commuter route from Route 4 to the base. And that fell apart over the years because of the timing and, there, and FDR did not, did not appear. So I believe this, this, this will be a project where, where um, we address some of that and we start putting some money aside uh, to build FDR and get that road completed. I think there's also a fail-safe um, provision that we see here is that we're just making recommendations on the approval of a site plan. Ultimate approval by staff will be made for the study and the adequate public facilities requirements. And if they don't like that, they'll come back here to see us again. No, are you saying that we're a recommender? No, we're up and down. I mean, yes, Mr. Hunt can veto it later, but but right. if we say no, nobody else can change that, it. That's correct. Except the district court, of course. Circuit court. 
Sir. I think it's district. Anyway, who could, a bunch of lawyers. <laughs> I, I still say that the, the traffic study is, is way out of line. It was done in, in 19. A lot of things happened since then. I have no crystal ball, uh, but uh, the traffic is down. I wouldn't argue that today's a nice day. Get out. I was working on my lawn, but I sure up was out of the house. <laughs> but uh, again, they're, they're, they followed all the rules. And again, there's no expectation that you're going to come through 235 and not have traffic. That's the way it's set up. I, I agree. Mr. Majdanski. Um, it's a tough call. Um, any progress, anytime you do anything, it's going to create more traffic. And, you know, people are going to get hurt. Well, that's, they have accidents. It's, it's not intentional. Um, I think 7 Eleven has done a good job here and what they've presented. And I, I can't fix the intersection, but I don't see where their project's gonna make it that much worse. I, I really don't. I think the same amount of traffic's gonna come and go just like it is today. Uh -huh. What is that? There may be a few extra people at that intersection turning, but other than that, I don't see, I don't have a problem with it. Did somebody like to make a motion? Yes. In the matter of ZAAP 20-132-006, Millstone Landing Appeal, I move that the Board of Appeals reverse the decision of the Planning Commission made on November 16, 2020, delaying the concept plan approved for a proposed convenience store, fuel sales, canopy, and car wash. Okay. A second. And a second. Um, Mr. Richardson. I, I Mr. 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 Chair, uh, I'm up, up, up. If, if I could please, since this is a de novo hearing, um, in addition to the language about reversing the um, the board of, or the uh, planning commission, I'd like to see the motion say we affirmatively approve the concept site plan. And what about the conditions that were put on it by the in the first hearing? I believe they had two conditions that that failed, but it was still with certain conditions. Yeah, so we're not we're not reversing. Will those conditions still apply? We're not bound by their conditions. Again, know, we're a de novo hearing. Consider them. Um, I did not hear any conditions in the motion. I just wanted to make sure yeah, that I just the, that the motion was was uh, properly framed, not only to reverse the planning commission, but also to approve the concept site plan. Okay. I, I modify the... Well, what, well, before we do the modifications, what were the conditions? You have to get the, minute, have to get the minutes of that meeting, but uh, you got it right in front of you? <laughs> no. They, they don't apply at this point. No, but They don't apply, it. but there was... Do we want to? No. We, but we, we already said no earlier. They okay. don't apply. How do we know they don't apply when you don't even know what they are? There's a motion on the floor. Yeah, but I'm, it's a discussion after you have a, a motion and a second, and this is a discussion. So that um, motion um, condition that motion included a condition that the um, Mr. Knight, I, uh, okay. If I may speak on behalf of land use and growth management, I don't believe it's proper to consider what. Planning Commission did. You have the evidence that's been presented to you, and that's what you're to base your decision on, not base your decision on what Planning Commission may or may not have done. That's right. And they could come up with separate conditions. They could come up with any condition they want, absolutely. Right. Yeah, I was going to say. Part of the motion, but they certainly could. Okay. No, I'll pass on that. So, Mr. Richardson, I think you were going to make another addition to it about the site plan approval. In the matter of ZAAP 20 132 006, Millstone Landing Appeals, I move that the Board of Appeals approve the Planning Commission's concept plan for a proposed convenience store for the fuel sales canopy and car wash and approve this concept approve site. the concept site plan approve the concept yeah 
I don't know if that's worded right still, though. The first time he said reverse them. Well, because it's... So, so yeah, you would, re you would reverse the planning commission, but you would also approve the concept site plan. We're approving the, approve the concept. That's your de novo, no. Yes. Approve the concept site plan. Approve the concept. But, but we're reverse reversing the, the planning commission decision. But Correct. Also. We're doing both. Yes. 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 Okay, I'll second that. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Richardson. I say build it. Mr. Brown. No. Up. Ah, uh, yes. No. Yes. Motion is three to two. And let's see if I can find the right word. An order reflecting the board's decision will be prepared by staff and signed by the board within 60 days. A 30-day period follows from the date the order is signed, during which any aggrieved party may appeal the board's decision to circuit court. The recording secretary will mail you a copy of the order when it has been signed. Thank you, Mr. Longmore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. We appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have- Thank you very now. much. Thank you all. We have now the board minutes from the meeting of February 11th for approval. Has everybody had a chance to review it? Yes, sir. Our motion. Make a motion. We approved the minutes. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And then we have two um, orders uh, to sign. The first is for the Ballard Property Third Election District, the AAP number 22039. Now, and I believe that was sent out to everybody, and hopefully they had a chance to review it. Yes, and I talked to uh, the, attor the assistant attorney, and there was two things. There was one <coughs> thing where he looked like we cut and pasted, and he left the fact that there was a, a uh, um, garage, and this was a matter of putting a retaining wall. So he needed to clean that paragraph up. Also, uh, he had another paragraph where it bulletized where he said, although the applicants originally considered replacing the wall two feet forward and filling the space with soil, they are now planning to replace the wall in its same location. And that's not true because we were saying you build it first then take and, and put the dirt and take the wall out, because otherwise it may cause the house to crumble. And, and make a big mess. And so I suggested to him there that he needed to clean that up. I didn't see it in our package tonight. I don't know if Mr. Weisskopf uh, what, what, is aware. Which page was that? Uh, well, that, that one is, okay, I've got the, the one is on uh, page, well, they've got their numbered, it's 1017. Up in that right hand corner. That's okay. the last pair, the last bullet. It says to retain the integrity of the soil underlying the subject property, the applicant will first construct the new retaining wall two feet forward and fill the space between with soil. So you got a corrected version. So it appears that way. Now sounds that way. Now let's go back to uh, the next page, 1019. Okay. Uh, how do you, it's easier to say, down about this far. Okay. Uh, it, it's further the Maryland Critical Area Commission did not provide any objection to the project. And it's, it's for these reasons, the board finds that granting the variance to construct an attached garage. And that's what we were really doing in the, the other board case. finds the, the board finds that granting the variance to construct the retaining wall okay. will not adversely okay. affect water quality. Okay, he fixed it. So, I, so it's been fixed? Okay. Okay, I'll take a motion on the Ballard property. Did you sign the order? Okay. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The next order that I have is for the Trajina property, 7th Election District, the AAP number 202209. Everybody? That was fine. I move that you sign it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, the eyes have it. I'll sign these. Um, was there another order that we're missing? 
Well, do um, we need an order for the um, <laughs> appeal of the zoning administrator's decision? Board. Uh, yeah, on the uh, the marina project. Right. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, the applicant had requested that my office prepare that order, and I'm delinquent in doing so, so we'll have it at the next <laughs> hearing. Um, is, does that meet the 60 days requirement? It does, yes. Does. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Anything else for the good of the cause? Make a motion, we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, we're adjourned.